Hello and welcome to the MinMax Show, a place about games, friends, and getting better. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Jeff Marquiafava. Hey! Ana Diaz. <laughs> Are you, did you say something? Wait, can you... Can oh, you now we can hear you. Great! One more time, Ana no. Diaz. Hello! Beautiful. And Kyle Hilliard. Hey, look, Hansen, look at this. Get a little of this early. Kyle is holding orange bubbly, his most prized possession. He's going to be chugging 14 cans throughout the podcast today, so please look forward to that, audio listeners. Uh, we have just a hell of a show today. We are going to talk about some big things like the Halo Infinite delay, Cyberpunk 2077 news, uh, Rocksteady finally announced their next game, which is mind-boggling, so we'll talk all about that. And then... It is a beautiful scattershot of great indie games to talk about. And then we're going to have a community top 10 list. And then back after the show, obviously, a bunch of community questions. Thank you for watching this. Thank you for listening to this. Um, if you want even more MinMax this week, we have the deepest dive going on for Halo Combat Evolved. I always say the podcast, it's like for recording purposes, it feels just like a dessert at the end. You know, this is the fun part, but the real meat and potatoes of MinMax this week is that deepest dive on Halo Combat Evolve, where we're talking about the game in multiple sections. The first episode that went live is covering the first half of the campaign, so the first five missions, and it turns out that game is very cool. Uh, I have never finished it, and so it's fun going through it for the first time, and we were all very excited to get in the mood for Halo right before Halo Infinite came out, and then... The world said nay, and Microsoft said not quite, uh, and they ended up delaying delaying Halo Infinite uh, until 2021. That's the next gen term for it. Is that's delaying. right? Uh, 2021 is what they cryptically say. Kyle is a big Halo fan. What was your reaction to that one? Surprise. I mean, mostly just because it was so tied to the launch of the Xbox Series X. Yeah, like that for me was the main reason to get a Series X was to play the best version of Halo. I th like arguably I mean I suppose if you have a higher end PC maybe that's the best way to play but like now I'm like well I don't know do I I don't need one at launch at this point right like and I think a lot of people reacted like that I'm, in terms of the game like it's not that big a deal to me that it's been delayed like it's a bummer um, I'm I would ha happy to wait for the best version of that game but yeah. I do think it's like man that's I think that really hobbles the series X a little bit you know or a lot or entirely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's fascinating to see how Microsoft is pivoting and trying to change their message. And so the official message, which is fun because it's in like, you know, a post and then also Aaron Greenberg on the Microsoft team over there, he tweeted the same thing about saying, Xbox Series X launches this November with thousands of games spanning four generations. Like that is like their go-to bullet point. You know, in some meeting they had just focus on thousands of games covering four generations, thousands of games covering four generations so that you can ignore the fact that now we've lost our huge tentpole game for this thing's actual release. I mean, I do, I will say that to the credit of that message on the occasion where I'm looking at a game on Xbox Live or PlayStation Store, I am leaning more Xbox because I know it's more future proof at this point, you know? Really? Yeah. Um, more but, future proof. Yeah, I mean, I don't, there's, yeah, I don't know. Is there, uh, we'll see if there's any kind of big launch title for it or anything. I don't, I don't know at this point. I mean, it's going to be updated versions of some Xbox One games. Um, it, I would love to know what shape Halo Infinite's in if Microsoft was under that impression of like, we can't squeeze anything out the door. It seems like they could have lopped off multiplayer or tried to do something just to get some piece of software out there at launch. Yeah. Yeah. And like it's, it's weird coming, coming off of that presentation when they just showed it off for the first time and clearly going into that, they were like, man, this is going to be awesome. We're showing off the new Halo and then obviously the the you know social media aftermath of that was very critical. Yeah. And so then for for this to be what follows it up, it really makes you think like, eh, this doesn't feel like it's just yeah we need a couple more weeks of polish in order to you know get this thing up to our personal standards. It seems like they were feeling confident about it, and now they're reassessing in perhaps maybe a larger a larger role than yeah i was definitely in the camp of well i mean yeah i know people were critical of the art and and maybe some of the gameplay presented but i don't think that would actually be the cause of the delay but it's like oh actually might be something to that there might be enough of an outcry be a factor you know, i'm sure how much of a percentage but yeah right know. so officially the reasons for delaying halo infinite are that they say hey it's partly covid and then it's a nice message in there saying you know partly for the well-being of the team we can't possibly hope to ship at launch um yeah 
Anna, and I mean, that's certainly among the reasons why I'm like, well, I, I, I don't mind waiting to play that game. I'll, I'll wait yeah. however long they want. Yeah. You know? But I think it's going to be a bummer for a lot of Xbox fans out there that have been jonesing for this thing for years. But here's what I'm curious about. The Xbox Series X and Halo Infinite. Do you think that this delay, because Microsoft seems to be slipping more and more uh, and saying that like, oh, you know, the first couple years of Xbox games, it'll be on both. But then there's a lot of that confusion, in the fine print that it looks like, OK, it seems like more of their games are locked on the new gen than we first thought. Do you think there's any chance, any chance that Halo Infinite, when it comes out next year, will not be on Xbox One? That it'll be a Series X exclusive? And PC. Who? Do you think like that's going to be their lesson? It's I like think we it'll need to... still be out on both, but I, I think it's like a question worth fielding because like if the visuals were were a you know a large portion of why this game is being delayed, and they can make like make it an Xbox Series X exclusive and really blow it out and make it look great, maybe that's an avenue they would take. But I think I think they still see more value in it being available on more platforms than having it look really good on series x but in that confusing way won't it be available on lower platforms just through x cloud so they I still mean, have that messaging that if they want it now playing ps2 games and i feel like no one really considers it that way you know i know but i'm just saying they don't have to do a full you know it's not they need to that they need to fully absorb the guilt of we're killing the previous generation version if it's like well if you use xCloud, you can still play Halo Infinite streaming onto your Xbox One, but it's just the Series X version. There's kind of some wiggle room there if they want to lop off that version to make Halo Infinite look better. I mean, that would let them continue to keep their promise, is what you're saying. Right, right. right. In yeah. a way, if you want to read into the yeah. fine print. Yeah. I don't know. It's a good question. So they also confirmed that the Xbox Series X is going to be coming out in November. Just ambiguous November is what they're leaving it at, but uh, <laughs> nice to see. We're getting closer. Yeah. In that game of chicken between Sony and Microsoft, I feel like Microsoft was like, we have a, we have a release date window <laughs> for this one month. Did Sony, are you going to say anything? Okay, okay, no, it's just November. It's just November. That's fine, that's fine. Um, did you all, forgive me if you talked about this on last week's show, did you all see the controller leaks for the Xbox? I mean, there's controller leaks for both. But there's what? controller leaks yeah. there. Wait, yeah. do we already know what the con- specifically the Series S, right? Oh, so oh, weird. Because yeah, we already the saw the Series X of a controller that leaked. There was like this controller works on both the Series X and the Series oh. S. Oh, which is like interesting. The indicator that there is going to be that that uh, that other version of the system that won't be as strong in theory, oh, but probably okay. be a little cheaper. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's exciting. They've been so cryptic about, you know, we're going to be having updates every month. We're going to reveal the next console at some point and have a hardware-focused thing. And now it seems like, what did they say? That is probably not happening in August, but there's still the Series S looming out there for whenever they want to have that hardware-focused stream, which I'm just fascinated on a message front to see how they position that thing. Where does Where's Series S going to fall if it's less powerful than Series X? Yeah. I mean, so it, it'll be like an still Xbox more One than versus Xbox, an Xbox One X. It's it's just we have way too many S's and X's going on. Well, of course, at this point, <laughs> I, it's just going to be a cheaper option for specifically for parents looking to buy it for their children. Like that's the main thing. Is this just like oh that one's a little bit cheaper? I don't really care why it plays these games. Okay, I'll get that one. It's kind of what it's going to be. But isn't isn't that also the Xbox One and Xbox One X at this point? Yes, but that's why they're just continuing. That's why they're just continuing the X and the S model so that they won't have that confusion. Believe it or not, there's some name confusion with Microsoft. It's just, I think it's bizarre to see them drop the ball on the run up to release. I think their messaging has been spot on and solid for quite a while now. And now it's just like this triple whammy of like, hey, the Mixer, Facebook stuff, that didn't exactly go well. Trying to, you know, move people into streaming onto Facebook and just collaborating with Facebook in 2020 doesn't seem like the coolest, tippest move. And then there's that confusion over like, okay, maybe everything won't be cross-gen for the first couple of years. Maybe some developers like Obsidian uh, do want to focus on the new gen or Fable will only be on the Series X. And now this, right? Where it's like, eh, mm-hmm. Halo Infinite is not going to be ready, which, yeah, it's a, it's a huge blow. I think it's going to be a decider for a lot of folks this holiday. 
I still want to see what their what their kind of overarching plan for Game Pass and Xbox Live Gold, and you know whether they're they've said I think at this point that they're not merging the two or that Xbox Gold isn't going away. But I I still feel like that is the end game. And if you can tell people, hey, you can buy this new powerful console, you'll have all of our previous games. You're just going to have to wait a little longer for Halo. Maybe that will still you know, have appeal for people who are already built or, you know, bought into that ecosystem. Yeah, never know. And, you know, it's that thing of, I think a lot of people are going to be so excited to play third-party games on the new systems this year. Maybe it won't feel as empty as you'd like to imagine. Yeah, it'd be cool to have Halo, but I mean, a majority of people are just going to be playing Cyberpunk on this thing anyway, and having that on your new console will feel like the, you know, nice way to christen in the new generation. Yeah. Which, but then, ha- have they said, though, that, like, the release date for the next-gen versions of Cyberpunk? The last I heard, it was kind of like, they're coming later. They haven't said specifically when. But God, is that true, right? But Cyberpunk, when you play it on a Series X or a PlayStation 5, it will look a little better. It will run a little better. And then there yeah. will be the dedicated next-gen version early next year that you will get upgraded to automatically. Oh, okay. Oh, have they so said like, early next I mean, year? Yeah, I believe that was like the last they said. I could be wrong about that. But I mean, it's still like from that perspective, like the best way to play Cyberpunk in November will be on a PlayStation 5 or a Series X in terms of console. What? You know what I mean? Oh, console. Yeah. I mean, obviously PC is yeah, even not the way a, to go yeah, there. PC changes all that up, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, did anybody watch that Cyberpunk stream earlier this week? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeff, what would you think? You're looking forward to this thing the most? You won it in the last episode? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it's been elevated to that level where I, where everything I'm watching, I'm looks too good to be true. And it's like, well, how, you know, like they're doing a hell of a job pitching this game to gamers at this point. And, and I would absolutely love if it all lives up to looking and playing as cool as it looks and being as deep as they're making it sound. Um, but that that just seems impossible. Yeah, you know they're in a good spot when they're focusing on, okay, here's like the three archetypes you can start with, Street Kid, Nomad, and Corpo, kind of the three roles you can choose out of the gate there. And it's like, I think a lot of other companies would trickle that out, tease that info, like, okay, here's the Street Kid trailer, here's the Nomad trailer. But I think because they want to emphasize that idea of, oh, you have all these options. They don't want to confuse anybody thinking this is the only role that they're just so confident it's like we got trailers for days we got content for days here's just a summary of all three right now and you can choose what you want as you go here yeah and and they're really nailing the kind of dev diary presentation and like the i always think of it as like the rock star presentation of these trailers that have a ton of information and are really meaty you know it's it's not Anyone can make a flashy looking trailer, but when you can really pack in a bunch of information, that's that's what's the most interesting aspect of it to me. I don't really care how many explosions you put in a trailer. Like I want to learn about the systems behind it and and it it's it's all looking very impressive at this point, to the point where I, I don't know how how much you can believe that and how much I have to start tempering my own expectations. Are you worried about anything with Cyberpunk? Um, I, I guess not worried as much as just unsure of, you know, how, how that gameplay is and how, I mean, it, it looks like a, it looks like a giant, very, very immersive city. And, and that just see it's, it just, the scope of it seems impossible at this point, based on what I know of games, having worked in the industry for 10 years and playing them. It it just doesn't seem like that's going to work, and and I'm looking. I'm I would love to be proved wrong about that. But I, yes, I would still love to see if they just. I don't know if they'd ever do it before release. But like, hey, here's actually what the PS4 version will look like, or here's what the Xbox Series X version. I know yeah. we're all seeing all this amazing PC footage, and maybe they can just scale down the number of people wandering around that city or something. But in terms of the scope, the crazy thing is the city, and then also. The Badlands, which is where you start if you choose the Nomad uh, in the beginning. But then they say you can go out to the Badlands at any point. It's not like if you choose the Nomad, you can't get out there and just wander around the wastelands on your own. But that area alone looks huge. Yeah, and just extremely pretty. And uh, and and the the different, you know, 
origin stories looked completely different and and just go f- so far beyond what most games do. You know, I think like maybe Dragon Age, Age Origins was was right. one of the few games where I felt like, okay, like it really makes a difference what I'm picking. Otherwise, it's like, okay, you got kind of a starting perk and here's a paragraph that explains why you're kind of different from other classes. But this this seemed I'm I'm interested to see how much that kind of opening part that you're playing how long that ends up being but it, but they certainly did a good job of explaining some of the differences in different missions about how how that choice reverberates through the much larger experience yeah and saying that'll impact even moments later in the game too and you'll have different insight into different people and corporations as you go uh kyle did you have an opinion on who you're going to choose tom blackburn wrote in just to jump the gun a little bit from the community uh saying I wonder if we're going to choose Street Kid, Nomad, or Corpo. Um, I, I'm probably going to go Street Kid because it seems like the most cyberpunk experience, like the straight on, like, this is what cyberpunk is meant to be. Yeah. Know? Where Nomad and Corpo seem like a little unique and outside of like the main pitch of the game, which is cool. But like in terms of like getting, playing exactly what that pitch for that game has always been, I think I'm going to go Street Kid. Yeah, I'm feeling, yeah. are you feeling the same way, Anna? Well, I mean, I was thinking through it and like given that the choice seems like it'll like really impact like not only, you know, what era area you spend a lot of time with at the beginning, but like how characters react to you and how the world reacts to you. Like I imagine, yeah, for like the tone of the game, I'm actually kind of surprised that they offered that Nomad one because it just seems so far. I know that that's not like the whole game, yeah, but it seems kind of like why would I... To be honest, like my only question that I had is like, why would I want to play as the nomad? Because then I'm just going to be like an outsider in this world. Like, wouldn't I want to be like the person with all the like ins and outs and like who's like very um, street smart? Um, but maybe that provides its own story, right? I don't know. No, but it's so, an interesting we'll point that. to think about like how are they going to vary exposition, you know, for your character based on that? I How much can it be generalized across all three options versus... If you're the nomad, you come into the city, it's going to be a lot of like, welcome to Night City. Oh, you go this way for that. Or even just like, here's how these corporations work. But then if you're the corpos, it's just like, yeah, you, you know the drill. Let's go. It's like, are you going to be a yeah. little bit more in the dark as the player? Or God, that's going to be an impossible job to write that variation yeah. there. Yeah. And I am at like the way I'm imagining is like, well, maybe there's like a specific bar with a bouncer. And if you're in the like, um, whatever, the street storyline, I forgot what it's called. Like you um, can just walk in because the ban- bouncer knows your family or knows you or whatever. But if you're the yeah. nomad, maybe it takes a while to like, maybe you need to do a quest for him and then it'll be like, okay, you proved yourself, blah, blah, blah. you can go in. Right, right. I think yeah. uh, maybe it's just, you know, going back to Stardew Valley and selling my soul to Joja Mart. But I think the corpo <laughs> has to be the least popular. And so I'm always trying to think of what the least popular option is and I want to be that. And I think I'm going that direction. But at well, least that's corpo, terrible. I disagree with that. The corpo at least has like the intrigue, you know, and yeah. like the corruption and it, like that that is that is the one that is the one reason that I am also really interested. I'm never going to do it because F the corpos, <laughs> but but, no, but, but, it, it, but it, it does it does sound very interesting in terms of like it, it seems like you're installed pretty high into these organizations that otherwise you would just be completely shut out of, and they show right. like board meetings and, and like these yeah. weird interactions with people, and that that does seem really interesting. I suppose if you can tear it down from the inside, then maybe you'll be okay. And so, if yeah. everybody is no, going I, roughly the same direction, yeah. I also, this thought is: Is Street Kid going to be more of an action game? Is Nomad going to be more of a like a driving game? And is Corpo going to be more of like um, just dialogue and talking to people? Hey Kyle, I have a feeling you can play this game any way you'd like. You could probably yeah, bend. Totally I could probably be in really. Corpo and then still get in a car and go to the Nomad and whip these <laughs> out there for a while if I really want to, right? <laughs> Do donuts? But, hell yeah! But like, um, I wonder if the Nomads you. like the majority of the beginning Nomad missions are going to be just like a lot of driving from point to point. The majority of the beginning Street Kid missions are going to be like you're going to get into a lot of tussles and shooting and melee. I don't and know. Corpo, I wonder if a lot of beginning missions are going to be like you're having a lot of discussions and making a lot of choices that way. You know? Yeah, I'm not sure. I remember hearing on the Game Informer show. I know Game Informer got to play the first four hours, and they were talking about how like oh, in the beginning there's more driving for everybody than they expected, and the driving okay. is fine ish you know it's a little bit of that oh, like fine ish it was right. a little bit like okay right. not not right. amazing handling overall but yeah. i think there is 
this feeling that I have of like the world is getting so excited for Cyberpunk 2077. There's a part of me that's like, this still could be a little bit more rickety than we imagined. You know, everybody is yeah. seeing it as, oh my God, it's not a, another iteration for CD Projekt Red. It's going to be out of this world for an open world. But like, they're, they're very good at making Witcher games. This is a huge yeah. change for them. Don't expect this to be an iteration. I mean, it's a radical shift for that entire studio. I just, I'm bracing people in my mind for like, this could end up being like an 875 and we have to brace for not being the end of the world if it's only at that, you know? Yeah, for for sure. I, I mean, like, how many overlapping systems are there with The Witcher in terms of, you know, it being so gun focused and, you know, just like completely different tech? I'm, may, maybe the cars handle like horses and that's why they said it's just kind of OK. You do have to whistle but, for all of them out in the open world. Yeah, yeah it's messed up. Um, but but the, all the all the gun the gun stuff that they showed the upgrades and stuff all looked really cool too. They, it seems like very different takes on gunplay than what, like every now and then you'll get like kind of a specialty novelty weapon in a first person shooter. But it seems like these are kind of, there are a couple core classes of guns where like some can shoot through things, some can ricochet bullets. And then you have like the smart bullets that you just kind of lock onto someone and they'll, find their way to them and that i i was surprised that that's that that's not just a you know one gun can kind of do this smart shot thing you know like titanfall or something like that but it seems like these are core classes of how the gun combat is going to function yeah and then you don't even need guns because they also have the best weapons which are gorilla arms and mantis blades yeah it's fantastic any game that has gorilla arms as an option you really can't look away from uh i I was checked out. I did not know about it until this week. I don't know if this was the reveal or not, but just their connection to the band refused. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, that was so confusing, that idea that, okay, so there's going to be Keanu Reeves, his character in the game, Johnny Silverhand, is going to have a band, and then they got the refuse to perform all the in-world songs and basically play a character as they write these new songs. <laughs> Sure. Very strange. And I love That's even that little, that little Vidoc that they released, just like the teases of Boris from CD Projekt Red, who's a writer. I met him when I went there for uh, the Witcher 3 trip. And uh, just like him, like critiquing the band and critiquing the way he's singing, because like, well, you, you can't have your accent. You actually need to be sounding like an American in CD Projekt or in Cyberpunk. It's just a very strange situation here. But do you think Keanu wanted to sing for himself? He's got that hot band dog star. Don't you think that would be a push for him? He probably doesn't expensive. care. <laughs> That's it. It's too expensive to make him sing all these rock songs. Yeah. 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 I guess that more than sense. $50 tier. Yeah. Oh my God. I can imagine on the counter Reeves Patreon tier where that's going to land you. Anyway, Cyberpunk 2077. Um, as I was watching it, I was realizing more and more like we have to do this for a deepest dive, right? It, I think we're insane if we, don't do the biggest game of the year. Yeah, but how are you going to structure it? Like That's the tough thing is hopefully there's some shared narrative quests for I, everybody that we can just say stop yeah. around this area. It's going to be messy. That is the problem. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. And we'll talk about it more with the community and what they want to do and stuff like that. But as I was watching this, I was just slowly realizing more and more that uh, it's stupid not to try to do this at least or at least bring up that discussion so please look forward to news on the next deepest dive everybody um kyle after yes. years and years of waiting for any news on what rocksteady is working on uh they just tweeted it out they just tweeted it out man walk it's, me it's, through it's suicide squad <laughs> and how do you feel about it i feel good um, I'm excited for a Rocksteady game. I like that they're still in the DC universe. I don't really know Suicide Squad very well. I've seen the movie, but that's the extent of my knowledge. So, and I didn't like the movie very much. I didn't think it was a very good movie. So I like the idea of like a, like a DC comic book storytelling video game studio that I like, and I like their stories, giving me a new perspective on these characters. And I also like that Superman seems to be an element of it because I feel like Superman hasn't really been relevant in a long time and especially not in video games, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, I'm, I'm excited about it. I want to see what it is. I, I mean, I, I, we really don't know anything. We know it's called suicide squad. We know Superman's in it. There's assumptions that 
you're going to be playing as a member of, or members, plural, of the Suicide Squad, hunting down Superman, which is like a cool idea. The Amazon show The Boys is basically that idea. Oh, is it really? I and haven't seen like, it. Yeah, and it's like a it's a cool show that really sort of digs into the idea of like what what if Superman was a bad guy? How impossible would he be to kill? And it turns out very impossible. <laughs> so like I like I don't know I like nothing's confirmed. This is like us making assumptions. I mean they treated one image which I is the cool. logo crosshairs yeah, like, over they, Superman's head. There's like cursor over Superman's head that kind of makes it seem like a reticle, but like. I like, like, I'm excited. I'm super excited. Like, Suicide, like, Rocksteady DC Universe game. Absolutely. Yes. I am super excited. So you would have preferred this over them doing a new IP? Uh, no. If you had given me the choice, I would have taken new IP. But, like, they're, I, them, it, they're so good at working within that DC Universe that, like, they've proven themselves. I, I would, you know, I'm happy to see them get to sort of go further into it, you know, outside of Batman. But yeah, if, if I had been given the choice, you know, six, seven years ago, I would have been like, oh no, you guys do something completely new. I want to see what you can come up with. But yeah. And I was, I had this weird reaction like, oh, I like Rocksteady's games so much because they're focused on Batman and doing like a whole group of characters. I think we've learned from Crystal Dynamics and Eidos' work for Avengers that that's very hard to pull off an entire team of characters. And then I realized this moment of thinking, wait, no, like, in DLC and everything, Rocksteady's already experimented so much with playing with other characters. Like, here's a rundown of playable characters in Rocksteady's Arkham games. Uh, obviously, Batman, the Joker, you could be in the PS3 version, uh, Catwoman, Robin, Nightwing, uh, Deathstroke was playable in Origins, which is Montreal, uh, Red Hood, Batgirl, Harley Quinn. Like, they've already created all these playable characters that I think they're just teed up ready to go for actually pulling off a huge team if that's the direction they're going in which you'd have to imagine they are yeah i mean i certainly like the focus in terms of like i like narrative games that focus on a single character in general i don't really like character swapping so like if you were just playing as one member of the suicide squad i think i would like that more but like yeah i have confidence in that like i really have a ton of confidence in Rocksteady to do something amazing, even if it's like not necessarily my first choice, you know? Yeah. Like they wouldn't have pursued it if they weren't excited about it, I don't think. Right. So here's a weird wrinkle. Uh, Jason Schreier, friend of the show, uh, he tweeted, some added context for today's announcement. WB Montreal was working on a Suicide Squad game until it was canceled in late 2016. At some point, end of 2016, 2017, Rocksteady started theirs. The game will be teased at DC Fandom, but I wouldn't expect it for a while. Uh, and WB Montreal was working on a Damian Wayne Batman game, but that was also canceled. And then there's that new version of whatever WB Montreal is working on, which seems to be connected to Court of Owls, which that rollout has been very confusing. So this is what gives me pause, is I have so much faith in Rocksteady, but according to this timeline, if, if we're believing this here, and I think it's fair to say that it's probably accurate, um, the idea that WB Montreal teased at the end of origins a suicide squad game was working on it it fell apart and then rocksteady takes that project and not saying it's like w montreal's sloppy seconds maybe it's just oh this idea is so great that we need a greater studio to pull it off but i worry that maybe rocksteady was taking too long working on something new fingers crossed maybe it was a new ip or something like that and then warner brothers is like well somebody just do suicide squad already please rocksteady go ahead and do it I, i hope it's coming from a real place of passion and it wasn't just you know, WB getting panicked, realizing that we need to give Rocksteady something solid they can get out the door. Like, here's Suicide Squad. It's it'll be a proven yeah, success. Like they're Go called for it. in as like the fixers at the last second. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. It, it the timeline looks like that, which has me worried. And now, you know, we've been spending years wondering what Rocksteady is working on, and now still, I think one of the greatest mysteries in the game industry is going to be what was Rocksteady's project in that gap then before they picked mm. up the Suicide Squad game because there's something after Arkham Knight weird yeah i don't know deal yeah um also you talk so much about uh superman kyle there's a lot of debate about whether or not whether or not that's actually superman in that teaser image because if mm. you look closely like his skin is kind of pale and it's got like cracks in it and stuff and so like some the bizarro kind of well this this is where it gets nerdy about. but yeah i joined the official suicide squad discord and was talking to those folks about what they think's going on and i brought up the bizarro thing because a lot of people are like oh i bet this is bizarro superman but people are saying that, correct me if I'm wrong, internet, please, but Bizarro doesn't have heat laser eyes. He has like ice ray eyes. So his eyes are glowing blue. Whereas this Superman image, the eyes are still glowing red. And then they were bringing okay. up that there's a character called Eclipso 
in the DC universe who like takes over characters' minds. And then when he takes over characters' mind, he makes their skin all gray and purple hair is kind of his defining look. So people are saying it even looks like that version of Superman. But there's a lot of speculation. Okay. And I hope that it actually is the Superman. I think that's a really fun idea. But just bracing for there might be some comic book nonsense here for it not actually being Superman that you're trying to kill in this game. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. But uh, I don't know. I like that. I, I mean, I like that deep dive into like DC. Like I feel like yeah. even Arkham Asylum was maybe the best at it of just like hiding Easter eggs everywhere for like really obscure Batman stuff, you know, stuff that I wasn't even really aware of or familiar with. And it like gave me the opportunity to learn about those characters. Like, so I, I, I'd be okay with them going, like f- pulling these obscure characters that like you just mentioned a few that I've never heard of, you know, like right. I'm totally okay with that. Yeah. Ooh, here's why the backstage pass is nice. So folks at that $10 tier on Patreon can watch us record this podcast live. I mean, Leafeon jumped in and he said, Hey, don't forget that WB Montreal developed most of the Arkham Knight DLC. So that is interesting. Yeah, I forgot about right. that, that it wasn't Rocksteady proper. So, okay. So maybe Rocksteady didn't develop that Harley Quinn DLC and all that stuff. But still, they've experimented with other characters. They obviously have Catwoman, stuff like that. Um, yeah. Let's see. Anna, hmm. tell me about your journey with Fall Guys. It feels like if Wipeout, that show, was made into a Battle Royale game. Yeah. Um, and then, like, crossed with Splatoon. But my whole thing is like, I feel, I feel real. I've actually, so this is actually in connection to the cyberpunk thing, but it's made me realize like, okay, like I, I think it's a good game. Um, it's fun, like very hectic Mario party vibes. Um, but it's not like the best sort of zany game that I've played. And so I'm thinking like, why is it so popular? Um, I think COVID is like the time for like games marketers. It's just like, okay. Like, it's the marketing around the game has been so good that it's just like drawn all these people in. Um, and like similarly with cyberpunk, like we don't really know what we're going to get, but this marketing team has done such a good job of like covering it and like building up like this hype machine around it. Um, and I think it's because so many people are just like zombied on Twitter. <laughs> Maybe I should only speak for myself. Um, Do you feel zombied I, on Twitter? Yeah, I feel zombied on Twitter and I'm becoming a fall guys zombie. <laughs> Uh, Fall Guy well, egg, there is, an egg zombie. I think there is something there. You have an interview that's up on our YouTube channel or in the Patreon exclusive yeah. podcast feed um, with the game's lead designer. And he pointed to that as well. He connected it to Animal Crossing, talking about like how yeah. in this dark year, the fact that Animal Crossing can be such a big hit. And then also Fall Guys, people are just hungry for stupid, silly laughter games. Although it doesn't discount that Cyberpunk's probably going to... Uh, break world records for the sales but other than that you know like people are just it pops people are ready for just something silly and fall guys just perfectly fits that slot uh jeff have you played more of this thing yeah i have uh and i i really appreciated that interview that you did uh because it it assuaged some of my problems that i've been having with it and i i look forward to some of their implementation implementations because i had Going, going into that, I like that he specifically calls out that they're not just going to remove team games because a lot of people are yelling that team games in there are bullshit. Right. Because I am, I am team game bullshit guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm on that. That's my team uh-huh, on that because uh-huh. I, I have just, yeah, I've gotten game. to the point We're where not. it's, it's just like, it is such a bummer when those team games come up because it's, and, and the other thing that he was talking about was was kind of the pillars of game design that they're going for, where, where it has to be a mix of skill-based and randomness or chaos. Yeah. And that it, it can't be all of one or the other. And I feel like the team games, it's, it is that random element. Like, like whether you're going to, no matter how good you are at Fall Guys, which isn't the point of Fall Guys, even the best player can't carry an entire team themselves. And so it's like that die is cast as soon as you go into those matches of whether you're going to get on to the next round or not. And I, I like the I like the team games. I think they're they're fun and they're they're a you, you know, a nice break from the other style of games, but I wish they were kind of their own mode where the where the point wasn't just not being eliminated because that yeah. That is such a bummer to get stuck on yellow team. And it's like, and, and and it's, it's also like, I think the predominant strategy for it. And I, I even saw like a PC gamer article telling people to do this. And it's like, no, don't, 
don't tell people to do that. But the the smart strategy for the team games is to focus on the losing team and steal their eggs or whatever right. else. It's like because yeah. only one team gets eliminated, you want to make sure that the losing team loses. Super loses. And so, yeah, and so, and so it becomes this griefing thing, and you and there's just no there's no good way to mitigate that. And so I think that's what's fascinating about this game is it has skyrocketed to success in such a huge way, like sold two million copies on Steam. There's a report today that there are eight million players on PlayStation Four, which is like, oh my god, it is number one on Twitch by a mile. It's got over a hundred thousand more viewers than Fortnite for Christ's sake, like. <laughs> It is so bizarre that this is the game that takes off yeah. in the way, but it makes me happy that such a silly game can hit that point. But, you know, I think we talk a lot about it in that interview, but just it's that fun dynamic of having a silly game that suddenly is the height of competition. It's like mm. the entire world is looking at Honeycomb Havoc from Mario Party 2 and being like, okay, how do we min-max this f***er? You know, like it's such a weird vibe to like see how much this game can sustain the spotlight of the internet trying to make the most of this thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Jeff, I think like the, well, in the interview too, gets at an interesting point. I think is really cool about Fall Guys is like it has that skill, but the randomness aspect, but it's not like it's, so it's like almost like a N Mario Kart or Nintendo, like yeah. the blue shell effect, right? But it, mm -hmm. it has that without the blue shell. It's just like, oh, you might just land incorrectly and just fall off and die. Yeah, yeah wh which I, I really like in all of the other kind of single event things. Like, I, I don't mind if I'm doing good at something and then I get hit with a spinning hammer and I fly off and I end up bouncing out of, a, you know, a competition that way. But it's it's the team ones <laughs> specifically that it's just like, come on, guys. Yeah, I get it. That's tough. Uh, Teases uh, wrote in on Patreon asking us what type of costumes we'd like to see in the future. He brings up the point that when this game is eventually ported to Switch, like the idea of a Nintendo crossover costume thing, that's got to happen, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I want I mean, uh, Fall Guys, Rabbids as Mario skin. Very specific. <laughs> in the very so simplified Fall Guys style. Yeah, okay. That's doable. I was really pleased uh, again with the interview, just him talking about their roadmap for it. And the, you know, it, it certainly seems like they're absorbing everything and that they are 100% committed to working on this. I like that. He said that, you know, that he, he would like in three years to still be working on this fall guys, as opposed right. to a sequel or something like that. And so Faller. it certainly sounds like they have, and they understand that people want more levels and, you know, because that's, that's a big, that's a big draw. The novelty of playing new levels and it not being too repetitive and stuff. So it, I, I feel like they're they're they understand what's important for them to do next, and they're heading in that direction. Yeah, so, I love how. Yeah, God bless the lead designer Joe Walsh for for doing that interview, and like, it made me laugh just how transparent and open he was for a lot of stuff. Like I asked him about you know incorporating the KFC brands and all these brands that want to get in there. And he's just like, God, I hope not. Like, I don't want to do that crap. And then later on, you know, I asked like if people have offered to try I guess is a better way to put it, to buy the studio and buy the Fall Guys IP. And he's like, oh yeah, everybody's tried to buy us at this point. And then I brought up like, oh, you know, what if Microsoft buys you three months from now? And he's like, oh, I hope that won't happen. And it's like, there's going to be so many things that I think years from now will be yeah. very fun to look back at when Microsoft buys them. And that's the new Xbox Series X launch game. Replacing Halo <laughs> Infinite is just the remastered version of Fall Guys. Why the hell Gets not? It's up to 120 players instead of just 60. <laughs> you won't believe it. Fall yeah, Guys, I, 120 I, FPS. I also liked in that interview where he was like, yeah, you know, like... Because you you brought up kind of having like different competitive modes or or like a team based only modes mm -hmm. or whatever, and he was like, yeah, you know, like we could certainly do that. We we just launched with like the one main one main mode because we didn't know if people were going to play it or not. <laughs> right, like want to split the ten million base. people. It's like, yeah, you can afford to do more modes now. Great, it's just bonkers. Uh, Anna, you've been playing more Valorant. Yeah, um, I've been playing the new deathmatch mode. Um, it rolled out this week, I want to say, um, to everyone and I've really been enjoying it. Um, so for those not familiar, the death match is just like a free for all. Yeah. Um, and it's like, there are teams, but you can kill anyone. But then when you kill someone, like it goes for like the point goes for your team. Um, and so it's actually, what's interesting is that 
I see it as like a very accessible entry point, like a to the to Valorant as a game, but literally to any game like that. So it's like if you've ever been interested in like in like playing a game like Valorant or playing Overwatch, I would actually just like suggest playing Deathmatch because it's like very simple, it's very straightforward. It's a little chaotic because it's like 10 people um, on the map and you're all shooting each other. And so it can get a little bit like, oh, great. Like I just died. You know, either you're on a roll and you've killed like seven people in a row or you keep spawning in bad places and people, you know, like shoot you on the spot. Um, yeah. So it's like a little so, but I would say, I mean, it's really fun because it's just like very stripped down version of Valorant. Just yeah. Like, and it seems like people were like, Jones in for just a straight deathmatch mode in Overwatch for a while. And I just Googled it here real quick to remember what the reception was. And there's an article saying that uh, Overwatch finally adds deathmatch and it kind of sucks. <laughs> but do you think that like Valorant with that hero based thing, it just works better in, in deathmatch or something about those ingredients where it doesn't feel like a, a letdown of a mode? I mean, I I never played the Overwatch deathmatch yeah. version, but like what I can say is that like, I mean, one, it like makes sense because like the overall aesthetics of the game, like the tone of the game, like it's feels fine to just play it as like a shooter. You're not using like all your abilities, like your walls and stuff like that, um, or your ultimates in this version. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and so like, I imagine like Overwatch would not feel like Overwatch if you were just, um, if you didn't, like if you were just playing with guns. Um, right. Okay. So, so yeah. Valorant it strips it all out and it is just basically a shooter. There's not a big yeah, it's, hero it's emphasis anymore. It's like, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's basically a shooter. Um, so in, then, in the counter strike overwatch overlap that Valorant claims to be, they just like took the overwatch circle out of the Venn diagram. And they're like, Oh no, it's just counter strike now, <laughs> but counter strike well, death match. It's like <laughs> yeah, overwatch yeah. audience. It's like counter strike for overwatch audience. Do you have a sense? Okay. That makes sense. Uh, do you have a sense of how Valorant's doing? Like, I know it's doing well. I think I might have been expecting it to do a little bit better, but maybe I just haven't been paying attention. I feel like I haven't seen too many people talking about it. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've seen a lot of people. I've seen most people talking about the death match, um, the spike yeah. rush, which was like another way of playing that's like not ranked. Um, isn't like that's sort of like hot and cold. Um, people don't seem to be too keen on that, but um. I think something that's interesting about Valorant is like it's not doing like incredibly I guess like it's not like tearing up the charts so to speak but I mean right it is kind of like one of the only options out there like a lot of Overwatch players did leave um like yeah. pro players left um and they're playing Valorant now um like and then in addition to that like the Amazon competitor got like unreleased <laughs> and so like there, there's this awkward thing where Valorant does seem like this sort of de facto option. Yeah, and um, especially if it comes to consoles, they say they've been testing it on consoles, but no official wording yet. But that could be just a huge boost yeah. in the arm for this thing. Yeah, it seems to be like appealing to a diverse range of people, and like it's um, you know people who put in the time to play it. I've seen like positive reactions, being pleasantly surprised, yeah. and so. We'll see how, you know, the, like those console on, you know, it rolls out on that. Yeah. And what that so, audience evolves to. So are people being nice? Like, or is it, is it <laughs> oh, pretty rough? I, Kyle, no. you have, you, you well, think that I have voice chat on ever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, good point. I absolutely. I mean, I, I played I, in beta and I thought it was fine and I enjoyed it. And I was like, oh, I think I want to play more of this. And like, it went live. And like the first day I like requested a gun, you know, cause you can say, Hey teammates, can you buy me a gun? Yeah. And it was just like, I'm not going to buy you that gun, you asshole. F*** you. And I'm like, <laughs> guys, it's like the second day. Like, we're just trying to figure this thing out, man. Yeah. And that really yeah. turned me off. But I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe I just need to take the no voice, you know. Or yeah. just stop begging for people yeah, for you know? guns. Or you could play Deathmatch, which is like more casual. Um, yeah. I mean, that, well, that's what I'm asking. Is like Deathmatch seems like the at least somewhat more inviting environment to play the game, right? And yeah. Yeah. I want to try yeah. it again, oh, yeah, too, Yeah, definitely. Kyle. Yeah, the okay, deathmatch okay. thing. Yeah, it seems easier to to comprehend. Not that you know, taking those objectives was a deal breaker. But I've been looking for a way to try to get back into Valorant. And this seems like we could probably assemble a team. Is it five on five? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to say maybe it's like six on six. I'm forgetting, but okay. it's in that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. I want to check it out. Um, Jeff, um, you were demanding, nay, insisting. 
that we talk about shadow tactics. Yeah, it, it's not a good name. <laughs> Thank, thankfully, shadow tactics, tactics, the name is the worst part of the game. But um, it's actually, it, it's a game that some of the community members recommended to me because I played Desperado 3s a while back. And it's it's the game that the Desperado 3 developers made before Desperados 3. Right. And it is very it is very easy to tell the lineage of that, but basically it's it's another real-time stealth game, but instead of being set in the Wild West, which doesn't make a lot of sense, it's, you know, ninjas and samurai and things like that. And is it on Xbox? It's on it's on all consoles at this point, yeah. Oh, okay. And how old is because it? A couple, couple years, hmm. I think. But um, it, I mean... They they are very similar to the point where you can see like okay this ability is just like this ability in the other game and that kind of thing they're they're kind of shuffled around to different characters but it is still that very much they they will put you in a giant you know like clockwork puzzle map where you just have all of these different pockets of enemies with very specific routes and you know view cones and things like that that you're trying to figure out and sneak through and figure out okay how can i take all of these guys out stealthily Mm -hmm. and then move on to the next area and they they certainly don't hold back in terms of just throwing you directly into these massive levels the tutorial is like super short and then it's like okay here you go like good luck to you figuring this out um but it it is just such a neat a neat formula for for kind of reimagining how to do, you know, stealth games like that. I've, yeah. I've always liked stealth games, but I've, I never imagined that a real-time strategy one where you're you're kind of coordinating multiple characters in your party would work, but it, it works super well. They're the only ones doing it, but... Yeah, and that's a good sign a for Desperados formula. 3 that you can play that game this year and then still be hungry for more in that formula. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would say that you can you can definitely tell that they have taken you know community feedback to heart from from shadow tactics and kind of implemented a few more features into desperados 3 so if any of these games sound intriguing i'd say start with desperados but if you if you just really don't aren't into the wild west theme or if you've already played that one and you just want more of that kind of experience like it totally holds up yeah. Do you think Desperados 3 is going to be high on your top 10 list? Um I I wouldn't say high, but I but it it you know may make the list. Okay. All it, right. Which which in a year, I mean I think I feel like there have been a lot of good games this year so far and a lot of big contenders and so that that's definitely one of kind of the indie darlings that that I look back on still fondly and still have to go back to and play more of. Yeah, for sure. Uh, speaking of indie darlings, I, it always happens every year. I'm always worried about like, I, I haven't fallen in love with a game for a little while. What's going to hit me out of the blue. And then like this last week, I got a one, two punch of undermine and little wood, both just being like, yes, this is exactly what I was looking for. And I just even love, uh, undermine in particular, Jeff, um, we did the great goatee hunt stream and you've been playing it as well. I've been Playing it pretty much nonstop since then. I, I think it, it might, like the game clock said 16 hours or something in the past since day yesterday. And a half. That's amazing. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it... abs- it's absurd. It and it it's very much like um, Moonlighters, which I talked about yeah. last year. Uh, it, it's kind it's that kind of rogue like dungeon delving. You know, Binding of Isaac. I, like there are so many games now that just kind of enter the gungeon. Like, you know the formula, and then still, yeah. when there's a great one, and it just clicks. Like, well, this is just an undeniable formula. This is just yeah. about as good as the gaming can get. I I can't. I literally can't put the controller down. You know, <laughs> it was like three o'clock in the morning last night. I was like, oh, I'll just do one more. But but I think what it what it does, and what Moonlighters also did so well, is that they. Even though it is the rogue like you know permadeath thing, they give you so many different upgrade options that you do in between runs that it's still right. it still feels like you're making solid progression, which makes time. it a rogue light. Uh, but yes, absolutely, yes. it's a matter of going back every time and figuring, okay, what can I actually upgrade? Upgrade my attack. So just the, the broad overview, yeah, going through a dungeon, 
mining, you have a pickaxe, you can throw the pickaxe, so you're upgrading your attack, how much money you can bring back every time, how far you can throw your pickaxe, your ranged attack, your health, and then on top of that, there's other bonuses that you can buy as well before you go back in. One-time run or just overall bonuses that you can take with you. And then it's just that perfect formula of, okay, you know the basics, you're learning the enemies, and then still, I mean, hopefully for 16 hours it's it's holding up. I've played significantly less than that. Um, but still, I'm, I'm amazed that there's trickling in so many surprises, just new characters, new little optional quests down there. Like, okay, what? This mushroom guy needs three yeah. mushrooms to come back to him. Um, is it holding up over that crazy long play period, Jeff? Yeah. Was still trickling it, in new it's, stuff? It's still doing all kinds of crazy new things. I'm I'm still, I feel like I'm, I I am now kind of midway working my my way through the dungeon levels, which you you kind of start in the gold mine area, and then the next one after that is the dungeon levels. Okay. And I I've gotten to the final boss in that one once, but but yeah, they they keep on you keep on finding new people, and I like I found a dog down in the mines, yep, yep. and now now he's in my hub world and stuff. They they certainly. They have fleshed out the kind of in between runs of a roguelite, which I really appreciate. Who made it? Which studio? That's a great question. We should give them question. praise. Um, so it's it's one of those nice things too of is it's not in early access. Like mm. it's, I think it was in early access last year, so it's just nice to have this type of game and for it to really hit your radar uh, when it's like oh, fully ready to go, and it's on Steam. It is on uh, Xbox. They say they're working on on a PS4 and Switch version because like I will absolutely yeah. buy this game on Switch. It seems perfect yeah. for when it eventually comes there. But the studio yeah. is called Thorium. Thorium. Yeah, I haven't heard of them before. Um, but it's it's my favorite roguelite since Dead Cells. Like I don't play a ton of this genre, but definitely I haven't been grabbed this way for a long time. Yeah. I, it's my, I, I mean, I guess, like I said, Moonlighters is a very similar kind of format to this one. Um, but I'm, I'm having a ton of fun with it and I'm, I have been impressed and really appreciate the amount of depth and just variation that you get each time. Yeah. Kyle, are you going to check this out? Underbind? I don't know. Maybe. Really? It, not your it's genre? super yeah, not I, his, his yeah. kind of game. I mean, but. like you saying, like, it's the best since Dead Cells. I didn't really like Dead Cells either. Like, it's really rare that I even yeah. get into that kind of game at all. Like, huh. But I, I don't know. It's co-op, right? You can play multiplayer. It's on Game Pass. Ooh, is it co-op? I haven't tried. The trailer looked know. like it had multiple people in there, so maybe it is. I could be wrong about that. I don't want to make any promises. I mean, I, I like to try everything if it's, like, popular and people are talking about it, but, like, it, nothing that you guys have said has been, like, oh, I need to go download that right now, but that's just, that's totally personal taste. Like, just, that's... Yeah. It's not the genre that I'm in. Yeah, it's you know? it's yeah. probably it's not the kind of roguelike that I think is going to change your mind or anything. Yeah, and it is just yeah. single player too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry to get your hopes up. Sorry, everybody, but yes, undermine. Uh, check it out. I. It's the perfect podcast game. I'd argue maybe podcast game of the year so far. You know, we'll <laughs> have that uh, category at the end of the year for the the big I, list here. Yeah, I may have been listening to your Fall Guys interview while I was playing that. On repeat for 16 hours, so thank you so much. That sounds perfect. (laughs) Um, Anna, you've been playing an indie puzzle game called Mixalumia? Yeah. Um, So Mixalumia came out this week. Um, It's made by, like, it's pretty much a solo dev team um, with, like, some help from some other audio folks. Um... So it is made by Dave Makes is sort of like his name on Twitter. Um, And it's just like a small little gem of an indie puzzle game. Um, It's like a falling, it's a variation on a falling blocks game. Um, But what makes it different is that the board is like a, it's like the shape of a rupee. Um, And so as you drop the blocks, they can slide down. Um, So it's like one of those games where it's like, okay, I imagine people spending enough time with this and becoming, like, godlike. Um, but I, it would take a lot of planning and a lot of work to get to that point. So um, I just really like it because, like, I'm a fan of Tetris Effect and, like, I there's um, a lot of similar vibes. Like, the soundtrack also um, interacts, like, with the buttons you're pressing and it's, like, very relaxing and sort of, like, chill, sort of lo-fi vibes. Um, really beautiful, kind of like simple, pared down. Um, but then like also like the strategy behind it is like incredibly complex. And 
like I've picked it up three times this week. Um, and again, like I, one of my favorite games ever is Tetris Effect. So it's oh, like, wow, right up my alley. Yeah. Um, I am but, so excited to check this out. It's just on itch.io right now. Yeah. It's just, yeah. You can just buy it on itch.io. It's like $9 right now. And like, there are only like three boards that you play, but then there are five different play modes. Um, and so I haven't, I've spent a decent amount of time with it and I haven't been able to like even technically clear like one level. And so it is, um, it gets pretty difficult, uh, yeah. but it offers a lot of options to play. And I mean, if you're a Tetris person or a Puyo Puyo person or like anything along those lines, like I highly recommend. I, I'm very in the mood for this. This summer has been defined by puzzle games for me, like between yeah, okay. getting really yeah. into Puzzle Fighter this summer and then also paneled upon I've been playing a ton of on Switch uh, in like the SNES catalog. And so the idea of a new one that is a little bit more in the Tetris effect end of that spectrum, that's exciting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Definitely check it out. Mixolumia. Kyle, have you played much Paneled Upon? Have you gone back to it? No, just just that like right when it came out, I played it for, you know, one one extended round. Like it was a long round and it was cool. I liked <laughs> it. a long yeah. round. You need to do competitive. Competitive Paneled Upon is where uh, the game really clicks. It's on Switch. So it's in the SNES uh, oh. section, like the retro section, but it's yeah. uh, it's Japanese only, so you got to navigate those menus, but it's totally fine. You can figure it out. Go to Versus. It's Pokemon Puzzle League, you know? Okay. Uh, they eventually brought it over here. It's Tetris Attack and also Pokemon Puzzle League, but it is such a good, intense, competitive game. Like, you know, on my recent trip to seattle my girlfriend and i just played that for like three hours just like sweating and the nice thing is when you're running a super nintendo game the switch battery lasts for a fair amount of time so it was intense and it, oh it's just mind consuming it's so fun um jeff um neon yeah. abyss oh, wait hold on did yes. you say mind consuming <laughs> yeah that's why okay i don't know I, I get it like i like that terminology but i don't know if i've ever heard, I've heard mind blowing but mind consuming oh, seems like the mind opposite. Bending. Yeah, mind, mind bending. Yeah. I'm oh. imagining like a flesh eating bacteria eating my brain. That's what Panel the Pond feels like. Brain? Yeah. Yeah, right now. <laughs> but here we go, Kyle. I Googled uh, mind consuming, and it's a term coined by Tirson to represent a form of Jenga where one removes an article of clothing whenever the tower falls. So that's what I meant about paneled upon. It's a striptease Jenga. I got that. I'm I'm surprised there's a word directly correlated to that, but I totally understood what you were saying. (laughs) Okay, great, great. Uh, Hey, Jeff. Thank you for pausing the podcast so we can address that. (laughs) Anytime. Uh, Neon Abyss, Jeff, um, is a game you've been playing? Uh, I played a little bit of it, yeah. Um, And this this was another one I think... I think someone recommended to Leo, actually, during the goatee hunt. But Mm. I just poach recommendations at this point yeah of course uh, but it, this is another rogue like kyle so it'd be right up your alley um but it is yeah, a kind of I'll just it, it is a out. side-scrolling kind of metroid-esque roguelike oh shooter. wait metroid i'm back in okay <laughs> uh you, you probably won't be kyle because okay, uh, I'm it, gone again. It, it has a great aesthetic to it, it it's it's kind of this weird mix of like you're going through these old dungeons with gothic statues and everything but everything looks like it's been turned into a rave party so you, there may be like an angel statue with like you know the glow hoops around it and you know like spray painted everywhere it has it has a cool aesthetic and it has just a ton of ridiculous guns and items and power-ups and bosses like i never saw the same boss twice or anything like that um but Ultimately, what made me bounce off of it is it seems like the procedural generation of the levels doesn't really take into account the abilities that you have, mm. where it, it kind of it throws a lot of rooms at you where it's like, OK, this this treasure chest is behind a block that you need a grenade to blow up. But you just don't have grenades like I like you'll go through an entire run and you just will never find grenades. And there are treasure chests like that, you know in multiple rooms that you just can't access or the same thing with keys you'll find locked doors and at one point i i unlocked a door and i went through it and the next room just had like it was another locked door that i couldn't get past i just wasted that key and so it's it's kind of it it juxtaposed interestingly to me with undermine where undermine has a lot of the same mechanics but it seems 
much more forgiving in Undermind, where it, it, there's not a lot of situations where you find something and it's like, hey, I can't interact with that. And, but, you know, at some point during that level, you're going to find the stuff that you need in order to get in there. And I just, I was, I was feeling shut down a lot in Neon Abest. But there's, there's certainly that depth there and it, and peop, it certainly has been clicking for people and I can understand why it's just, it's not my kind of roguelike. Yeah. So. Kyle, what is going on? If you're watching the video version, every once in a while you just get up and go and look at the door. What is, is that some daughter well, stuff? Well, the first time, it, it gets hot in here. So if I crack the door, uh-huh. it gets cool. The second time my daughter was knocking on the door and she just said, hi. I was like, okay. She's like, all right, I'll, I'll see you later. It's like, all right. And then it just got hot again. So I opened it back up. Well, to be fair, Kyle, your daughter's probably wondering why you sit in a closet for four <laughs> hours at a time. Yeah, I don't tell her anything. She has no clue what I do. Uh, with really my smart day. man. I, just, I say, don't ask me about what I'm doing, and I won't explain it to you. Just trust you me, it's says, very okay. cool. <laughs> uh, Jeff, um, uh, real quick, also you played a game, game called The Tourist, that's spelled with a Y. Yeah, Tourist. why am I playing so many <laughs> games? My daughter is just like, are you talking about <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Wait, you were... <laughs> that's soundproof enough, Kyle. Uh, yeah, The, the Tourist is another <laughs> indie game... <laughs> Okay, bye, daughter. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can see her face now. <laughs> Just sh- shut that door, Kyle. Just as hard as you can. Uh, yeah, So, but The Tourist is another is just another game that kind MinMax folk messaged me on Discord and said, hey, you should check this out. Apparently, I will play any game if, if someone recommends it to me. <laughs> I'm like just going to start sending you dub. Yeah, but, but it, it's kind of an open world voxel, you know, based like, QB QB puzzle game puzzle QB. adventure game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm honestly having a lot of difficulty imagining all of this. Yeah, so so basically it's kind of like Minecraft, but from a 3D perspective, and you're just a tourist. It's tourist with a Y. It's spelled with a Y. Another great title choice. Uh-huh. But you show up you show up on this little island that's called Tourist Island, and you're kind of going to different monuments that have Ooh puzzles inside of them that you're trying to figure out and then you are unlocking other islands that you go to uh and it's so it it's kind of very simple gameplay but what's interesting about it is they just throw a ton of variety at you like every like you're you're going to different places like at one place i was doing pull-up challenges and then another place i went scuba diving and another place has an arcade with like multiple old school you know like retro games that you have to beat this one jerk all his high scores on them in order to complete that mission yeah. and they, I, it's it's just a breadth of and variety of of different simple little games and puzzles that you're doing That's as cool. you explore these places and it came out on switch last year and then it's on game pass now is that the secret sauce yep. for you yeah, that's it's another I, I made the mistake of going on Game Pass a week ago and being like, oh, this looks interesting. I'll download this and this and this and this. And I've been making my way through them, but they've all been super entertaining. OK, so. aren't you proud of me? I didn't make one reference to Red Dead Redemption 2. This is your time. You're yeah, talking I, about. I know it's back there. I'm stalling. OK, I'm, all right. No big deal. Just saying if people want to recommend a game to for you to play, it seems like that's one on Game Pass. Yeah, I mean, I can't come on here and recommend people play Red Dead. They all know that they've played it. So I know, but we want to hear you got to give them new stuff. It. I understand. Hey, hey, speaking of new stuff, everybody. Uh, there's a game called Littlewood that I actually mentioned last week on the podcast. I noticed that I just went 1.0 on Steam. Um, doesn't seem like a lot of people are talking about it, but it is very, very good if you are in the mood for something in between Animal Crossing and a Stardew Valley, where it starts out and it seems like, okay, this seems like it's going to be a Stardew Valley situation, but then as you play it more, you realize it's actually quite a bit different. It's more about town building, relationship building, Uh, And customization overall, you can actually change the entire layout of your town and people want to be near other things. So you're both building up and giving people what they want for the customization of their homes, but then figure out like, okay, I want to be near the coffee shop, but then this person wants to be near this person. And then that has to be near this coffee shop. So it kind of has like a dark cloud one element, but it's made by one developer named Sean Young. um, And the framework which at first is like okay this is a nice little gimmick but it actually it works throughout the entire game here um is your main character has amnesia and it's as if this is the aftermath of a huge rpg so everyone's talking about like oh my god the hero of solemn what a crazy move i can't believe you beat the dark wizard that's nuts it's like i don't know what anybody's talking about 
And so then it's just like all your companions <laughs> were on that quest with you, and they're like, oh, man, remember that bit with the fish? That was crazy. Like, oh, that's right. You don't remember that? Okay. So it's like this fun vibe of just getting to know people. Believe it or not, everybody wants to go on dates with you. Absolutely everybody. So you can <laughs> kiss your way through this town. It's a, it's a real fun time. And so everyone's trying to just get to know each other in the aftermath of this huge battle that had just happened. And now you're just basically Thanos farming. You know, it's like, all right, I got a little crop out here. I'm going to move this thing over here, go to the mines today, uh, upgrade these things over here. Um, It kind of looks like a little bit in that vein of uh, GBA Pokemon, kind of pretty streamlined, simplistic, minimalist art style overall. But I have just been loving it. It has like... Everything that's frustrating about Animal Crossing for uh, on the quality of life front, this game just nails. You know, it's so handy that it just, you don't have to have different items equipped to break a rock, to take down a tree, do this thing. It's like, whatever you go up to, it knows exactly what you're trying to do. If you go up to the water and hit a button, you're going to throw out the fishing pole. Or even if there are characters in your way, if you keep walking past them, it'll just pop you on the other side of them. It is just mm. as convenient as it can possibly be just to get you in that loop of slowly improving your town building out your farm if you want to do that, get into cooking if you want to do that. It's a delight. It's one of my favorite experiences of the year so far. Uh, I've really, really been loving Littlewood. And it's just on Steam right now. The developer said that once it went 1.0, which it now is 1.0, that he was going to start working on the Switch version. And it feels like it's going to be one of those games that when this hits Switch, people are going to lose their mind. It's going to be like a Hollow Knight second bump, I would imagine. I would hope. Are you playing with a controller on Steam? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Works out well. Um, so Littlewood is the name of that one. Check it out if you're in the mood for something in that Stardew Valley Animal Crossing vein. Uh, Anna, speaking of retro mm-hmm. Pokemon GBA style graphics, uh, there's a game that's in early access now, just launched in early access on Steam called Monster Crown. Yeah, so I have spent, um, played through like the intro and like the first, I guess, like, the Pokemon equivalent would be like route. Um, and it's really interesting. Um, I was like, I'm always like weary of Pokemon clones. Cause I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, it's going to take a lot to get me into like turn based combat. I mean, we've talked about this before. Like it's kind of like a tired way of playing. And I am, I'm interested in seeing mix up on that, but it's so, okay. So monster crown, it's Pokemon clone type thing. Um, very much in that vein. Um, the music is very, obviously inspired by like the game boy era pokemon games like ver- feels very nostalgic appeal to like the nostalgic pokemon fan in me yeah it kind of um, like i started it too and it feels like it's somewhere in between that gba generation and then silver and gold yeah yeah um and i don't know what your thoughts on this were ben but i thought it was really interesting i was the story was a lot more interesting to me because it sort of departs from Pokemon like philosophically, like your relationship with the animals, because it's about like, you have contracts with these monsters. You don't catch them. (laughs) Okay. Um, It is so confusing. Yeah. Like that contract thing really made me laugh because the option in the menu, instead of like, you know, catch or throw a Pokeball at them, it just says offer. Offer, And then you offer a contract with these Pokemon and then literally like a pen and paper pop yeah. out and the Pokemon like <laughs> signs the contract to join you. It's so absurd, but it's fun. Yeah. yeah. No, it's really different. And like you start off and it's whole, it's sort of grave warning is like those who only seek power will fall. And so it's very <laughs> different from Pokemon in the sense that it's like, it's completely like Pokemon, but like the message behind it is the complete opposite, which is like, you shouldn't only seek power. So, um, I, I, I enjoyed the story and I'm kind of curious playing through it more, like seeing how it l- sort of, if it delivers on that, like moral, I guess. Well, yeah, um, it seems like that's kind of the, the shortcoming right now. Just reading steam reviews is it just launched in early access and people are saying that there's really just kind of two big story quests. And then the rest is gameplay systems, which are a little bit unbalanced at this point of going around and leveling up your Pokemon equivalent, just your monsters. But yeah, if they keep expanding on that story stuff and actually pay that off in the 1.0 release, like it yeah. seems cool. Yeah, it could be really interesting. Which, uh, did you take the personality test and get, like, your monster? (laughs) Yeah, and so I went through all the monsters and it made me laugh because it's a little bit like that Temtem thing, which, by the way, Temtem coming to PS4 in 2021. Yeah, yeah, state of play. (laughs) Yeah, uh, state of play, yada, yada, yada. Um, But it's that Temtem thing of just... I'm so confused by their equivalent of elements. It's like, just do do the simple elements that we understand because in this one, instead of the elements, they have, uh, as the 
classifications of the different monsters. Brute, Will, Relentless, yeah. Unstable. It's like everybody knows that uh, Will <laughs> type is weak to relentless attacks. It's like, I, I, what is this? Yeah. Just give me fire and water, please. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I did that. I got like the weird kind of Cthulhu looking monster. I forget its name, but that was my choice. Okay, I did the like the whale one with the claws. It's literally like a whale with with claws. Um, <laughs> and it's the will that. type. Because then there's unstable. And I was like, oh, I don't want to pick this one. It's unstable. I didn't even realize that those were the types when I first picked. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I, just unstable is just a, a good overall type. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, but it seems cool. Uh, Monster Crown is the name of that thing. Do you think you're going to keep playing it? Or are you going to wait for 1.0? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I'm i going to pick it up at least one more time and see where it goes. Like, I want to see a little more of the story. Yeah. Um, How much is in there at least. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, hey, Kyle, uh, the mm-hmm. Midmax community over in the wonderful Discord. Um, we didn't do it last week, but for a while now we've been making top 10 lists where they will come up with a topic. Uh, we'll come up with a topic, and then they use the hive mind of the private Discord at MinMax to assemble a top 10 list. Uh, this week, I said, hey, have at it. Pick any topic you want. Uh, and they went with top 10 promotional tie-ins from video game history. Yeah, uh, it's a weird one. And you have this list? I have the list. Yeah, I don't... I don't... I don't have the, the details, like, in terms of, like, what the metrics they were exactly looking at of, like, the most... It makes the most sense to have this tie-in, or it's just the most exciting. I'm not sure, or maybe the most effective. That element I don't know, but I do have the top ten list, so we can we can run down that. I think sure. they really just wanted to get Minmax sponsors. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, here here's the qualification, Kyle. It's rank the following okay. games based on the quality and sheer audacity of their in-game promotional tie-ins. Oh, sheer, the sheer audacity. audacity. I like that a lot. I like that so a lot. Okay, yeah. I'm seeing Fall Guys. Yes, please have when it us. happens and the death doesn't allow it. <laughs> exactly. All right, top 10, Kyle. What do we got? Pull out that checkbook, Colonel. Um, all right, so number 10. Also, some of these I'm, I'm, I wasn't familiar with, so this is fine. Uh, number 10, Pizza Hut online ordering in EverQuest 2? Yeah, slash pizza. So is that like you could order actual pizza or was it all in-game? No, it's actual pizza. You could hit slash pizza and you would order a pizza. <laughs> I did not know about that. That would amazing. come That's to your house? Time. Yeah. Because they'd have, like, your billing and stuff, yeah. Oh, yeah, you guys. You didn't eat EverQuest pizza? No. Oh, it's great. Tony Hawk burritos, though. That I'm I'm ready for. (laughs) Yeah, maybe that's what triggered this whole thing. Probably was the Tony Hawk burrito where you go to Chipotle and then you can play the Tony Hawk demo. Well... Quick aside, I guess it was only for the first 2,000 people. So even though what? if you pull up the app, his, his you can still order the Tony Hawk burrito. <laughs> like, I, you're not going to get a code after the first, like, four hours of that promotion being available. Because I almost did it. I was tempted to buy a burrito so I could play that Tony Hawk demo. Do you? Th- but I was like... Yeah, do you think that they get a pass because it's, like, a nostalgia-driven game for having something as stupid as a Tony Hawk burrito? Like, you know, if Cyberpunk tried to pull off the Cyberpunk burrito, well, I guess... Anything separate well, Tony Hawk's is cool. a real person who really orders this burrito. So it's his custom order? It's, his, it's what he orders when he buys a burrito. It's just what a normal it? burrito, though. I'm going to say it. I'm yeah, gonna it's nothing fancy. It. It's like chicken and black beans and salsa. <laughs> and nothing rice. Fancy. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the old Tony Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a standard burrito that can be on any menu. I guess it's like chicken and he's the bird man. So. It all makes sense, man. Mm-hmm. All right, number okay. nine, Kyle. What do you got? Sorry for that aside. I, 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 was, I, I was ready to order a burrito, but was bummed when it seemed like I wasn't going to get the demo. It really took the wind out of my sails. Wait, hang so. on. Actually, if you want to make a Tony Hawk burrito at home, here's what it is. Okay. Chicken, burrito, brown rice, black beans, hot salsa, cheese, and guac. And you could be just like the Birdman himself. And then you print out a random series of like, I don't know, 16 numbers and you just like right. kind of sprinkle it in there. You chop it up. It's very, That's your download code. very important. No lettuce, huh? Are you oh. kidding? That's going to slow him down. That's just dead weight in your stomach. You need to be pure, water, efficient man. skateboarding machine. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Number nine, Kyle. <laughs> number nine, Mercedes Benz in Mario Kart. That was a weird, a weird one. weird one. <laughs> that but really like stood that out. Do you think Nintendo is just bracing for a lot of... I don't know, feedback on that one or people to be angry, but everyone just was so charmed by how stupid it was that it got a pass. Yeah, and it was also just like free. It was just like extra stuff for Mario Kart. So like, 
why not i guess mm-hmm. but do do you think that mercedes benz was bracing for like a boost in their sales <laughs> like, oh <laughs> it's coming up here you we go they had mario in commercials and stuff it was a weird uh team up it was strange you would Have not you seen that commercial jeff it's got realistic no. mario like handsome realistic mario coming out of a mercedes benz and like it's oh, weird what that yeah. is dumb well like a lot of car manufacturers have done like games marketing things um like i don't uh shoot i'm forgetting which company it was but like cloud nine did a collab with some car company and it was it was really funny so like this is like (laughs) another tangent um but i have a little cousin and she's 16 and she used to play for cloud nine and she um was in this commercial and we're like you can't even drive like (laughs) and they had all these teenagers like featured in this like sports car commercial and like they were like babies and so i just thought that that was like the funniest thing (laughs) uh by the way i looked at this mercedes commercial i had never seen this or i just saw images oh really i I just thought it was like some fan art thing i didn't know there was an actual official thing it looks like Henry Cavill yeah. with like a stupid big nose on and then like tripping over an ugly looking Goomba. Yeah, it's weird. Oh, hang on. I just that'll, look, that'll look. sell cars. That'll sell luxury cars. <laughs> <laughs> hang on. Speaking of ugly looking Goomba, uh, Anna, did you end up watching the Mario Brothers movie? Yeah, I did. How did that go? Oh, okay. Your first time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Watched it last Friday. Um, I thought, you know what? This was on me. I thought it was going to be like like the games. I thought there was going to be like more references to the games. Uh-huh. I thought Peach was going to be in it. Um, do it... not understand why Peach is not in the Super Mario Bros. Wait, movie. wait. Isn't she? Or is that Daisy? Daisy? No, it's Daisy. Oh, that's right. And I'm like, why is it Daisy? Also, like, really shook Because it's a Luigi to... story. It's a Luigi's oh, time. Sorry. Machine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> was, <laughs> well, Luigi is Mario's son in the movie, which is I was that right? Be, Frank was offended by that. Is that true? I thought he was a nephew. His no, son? His son. Wait. Yeah. No, no, because, no. They can't. He's Mario Mario and he's Luigi Mario. But then for some reason they're like, yeah, you can call us the Mario brothers. And I'm like, you're father and son. Wait, um, that can't be right. Is no, it? That's, yeah, I just saw it. And then... <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and then to put the cherry on top, NYU is canonically in the Super Mario's universe in this because Daisy goes to NYU. And I'm like, what? That's so absurd. Uh, so, yeah, but they I nailed would... Yoshi. Yoshi was yeah. cool. I remember thinking, like, as a fan of obviously yeah. of Jurassic Park, I was like, I like that Yoshi looks kind of yeah. scary. It looks like a real dinosaur. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it makes sense why it works for you, Hanson. I of guess. Of course. I guess I should have anticipated that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Yoshi was the highlight. I would say, and the Goomba with like when Daisy's like, "Can you go get me s- spoilers?" Daisy asks a Goomba to get steamed vegetables because she's vegetarian, and then the Goomba's like, "Oh yeah, duh, that makes sense." And so then he goes. <laughs> Perfect. I think. I think a question: the Illumination animated Mario movie, which yeah. will undoubtedly hew closer to like actual Mario canon. <laughs> I'd hope so. <laughs> will there be a reference to that movie in some way? Well, I think, I think they have absorbed the Mario Mario naming convention, so I could see that being a reference. And the reason I know that is because I remember. When we did that rapid fire interview with Miyamoto for Breath of the Wild, we asked for Link's last name, and he said it's like Mario. And Ben Reeves, who was doing the rapid fire, he said his name is Link Mario. And Miyamoto was like, "No, no, no, his name is Link Link." I was like, "Oh, okay." Of I always remember that because El Numo was like Linku Linku. Yeah, I know. Like, I always said that to me. Too. I always have Linku Linku in my head. Yeah. It never leaves. It's uh, mind consuming. Um, yeah. So number eight oh, is yes, corn please. pops in cruising USA. <laughs> what? I love corn pops. I didn't know it was in that game. How? <laughs> Just like a billboard? I guess. I, I guess. Some of these I don't. I don't know or remember. So, but yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, uh, weird. Um, number seven, Powerade in Enter the Matrix. Of course. Weird. <laughs> of course. Uh, this is one I. I don't know either, which is like blows my mind that I wouldn't know this. But number six is Dole Bananas in Donkey Kong Country. Oh, Dole is also in uh, Monkey Ball. Oh, I think. Or yes. maybe it's Chiquita. Okay, yeah. I think. Well, oh, OK. I need to look this up now. 
Well, I mean, there's uh, definitely a sticker on those bananas and monkeys. Yeah, okay. sure. and they're definitely a brand. Which let's see. Which donkey? Which Donkey Kong? Kyle? You know, that's I don't know because I I love Donkey Kong Country one, two, and three, and Returns and Tropical Freeze. I didn't play sixty four a lot. Uh, which might be heresy, depending on our, our viewership. But maybe that's the one that had dull banana stuff in it? Ha. Huh. Weird. I don't know. Um, yeah. Oh, according to Mario Wiki, the early cartridges of Donkey Kong Country contain product placement for dull bananas. No clue about that. Did not know that. All Bizarre. right. Cool. Learning sense. Something. Yeah. So, dull is also... Dole and Chiquita have been in... In uh, Super Monkey Balls, they're just like shamelessly oh, playing right? the chord here. Oh, do you think every time there's a new Monkey Ball, there's a bidding war between Dole, <laughs> Big Dole, and Big Chiquita? They all want to be eaten by I I. <laughs> <laughs> Not that baby crap. Uh, okay, number five: Pizza Hut, KFC, and Levi's Jeans and Crazy Taxi. Of course, okay. Crazy Taxi is not shameless remember because Pizza Hut was like a destination that someone could elect to go to. It's like, hey, take me to Pizza Hut. Like, yeah, all right. Uh, checks in Checks Quest number four. I mean, that's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm honestly surprised that's not a little higher. Um, number three, Seven Up and Cool Spot. I've never played Cool Spot. Like, Should I play it? Which is supposed to be a good platformer, right? Like it was a yeah. Genesis Super Nintendo era kind of platformer that people are actually positive on. Like they say, it's actually pretty fun. Yeah. And then uh, number two, Energizer Batteries and Verizon and Alan Wake. Oh. Oh. There's Because, like, um, they would use Verizon phones and there were Verizon billboards, right? Yeah. I thought that was going to go Pikmin because isn't Energizer Batteries yeah. and Pikmin as well? Or they have Duracell. Duracell. I okay. Oh. But there, I think the there are other brands in Pikmin, too. Um, I think so. I mean, it's a good place for that. The or, apocalypse. Uh, finding trash <laughs> Wally style. Uh-huh. But um, yeah, the, the funny thing about the Energizer and Alan Wake is like you rip through batteries so quickly in Alan Wake. It's like it's ammunition. So it's like these batteries are awful. I'm like ripping <laughs> through these things in like five seconds. Mm -hmm. Not the right uh, message to send. And uh, number one, Monster Energy in Death Stranding. Mm -hmm. Wow. Which is recent. Like a, an yeah. overt, very memorable one. Uh, that is makes sense. very strange. I mean, there's a lot of good Kojima ones. I'm surprised Doritos yeah. in Metal Gear didn't make it. You could wear like a Mountain Dew t-shirt in Metal Gear. Uh, uh, not Portable Ops. What was the other PSP one? Peace Walker. I remember now. Peace Walker, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah the, I, this list was cool because like I, I didn't know about a bunch of these. So. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Thanks Weird to the one. community like for putting that together. Yeah. We appreciate it. And the Discord there. Um, Thank you. Hey, uh, Anna, do you know how this whole thing operates? Yeah, we are part of a Patreon. Yeah, we are the Patreon. Patreon.com slash the next two ends. And the listeners. <laughs> That's right. Well. Uh, and you can become part of the Patreon if you want by supporting us at any tier. You get access to that wonderful Discord. And I, I cannot stress enough how nice the MinMax Discord is. It amazes me whenever somebody new enters and it is just like the nicest welcoming party in the world. So thank you everybody in the Discord for keeping that up. And thank you to everybody for supporting us and jumping in just to Prove me wrong, everybody. Um, let's see. Other things to plug. We had an interview go live on Monday, um, a day before the Fall Guys interview, um, with uh, Zach Mumbach and Ben Wander, um, who left uh, Visceral Games. They saw kind of the last era of Visceral Games. Uh, Zach worked on Dead Space 2 and 3. But they talk about the fall of that studio, working on Amy Hennig's Star Wars project, a lot of new details, which it seems like other sites are picking up on. It's an incredibly frank discussion. It's fascinating with those two talking about... Uh, Army of Two Devil Cartels development, which I'm obsessed with more than anybody else on Earth, I believe. Uh, working within Frostbite. Uh, just fun stuff like what it's like being in an executive meeting with EA's Patrick Soderlund, uh, watching him kill a pitch for a new IP in front of you, uh, making deals with Epic, how that whole th thing works out, uh, you know, how... Uh, Epic has like a couple different deal options for a year of exclusivity versus lifetime exclusivity, the benefits of doing both those things. If you're interested in that behind the scenes stuff in the video game industry, I think it's a really interesting interview. You can find it on our YouTube channel or in the Patreon exclusive podcast feed. Um, and then also on Friday, we have a new episode of Mint Tracks, our music podcast. Uh, Paul Charchian, who's a Minneapolis radio guy, a very smart, a nerdy guy. Uh, he'll be on and they're going to be reviewing Yola Tango, an album from them. Uh, and I forget the other artist, but you can check that out in its standalone podcast feed 
Also, thanks to Patreon supporters like Captain Stubbs1. He says, hey, MinMax family, I'm back with a new project this time. Have you ever wondered how bad Fallout 3 lockpicking is? Or how often you should be changing the keys on your home? Come over to the Ask a Locksmith podcast, where all these and more are answered. Every other week on all major podcast apps, I sit down to answer the burning questions sent to asklocksmithpod at gmail.com. I'd be happy to answer yours, too. Jeff, if you had to ask Captain Stubbs one a question about locksmith, locksmithing for his Ask a Locksmith podcast, what would you choose? Uh, which game has the best, the most accurate mini game? Uh, we asked him that. Uh, he called into Better Quest, uh, and he said Assassin's Creed Unity, which people were shocked in the comments that he chose Unity. But hey, write in to ask him why and that's the ask a locksmith podcast thank you captain stubbs one also thanks to bambox bambox says we want to say thank you to the minmaxers and other gamers out there who helped make our first gamer box a massive success everyone seems to be loving the crash bandicoot uh Pops signed by Brendan O'Brien, the original voice of nearly all characters in the original Crash trilogy, including Crash himself. The next box is in pre-order and will be full of more collectible items inspired by Battletoads, Final Fantasy VII, Resident Evil, along with a mystery franchise. Another signed pop is also guaranteed. By ordering, you'll become part of the exclusive band community of true gamers, qualifying you for epic giveaways and much more. Check us out at The Bam Box. Thanks to The Bam Box for sending a Bam Box here with the cool... Uh, Crash Bandicoot Funko Pop signed by the voice actor and a bunch of other fun Zelda pins and stuff like that. So check them out at thebandbox.com. And thanks to I Am 8-Bit for their continued support of MinMax overall. We have a huge ongoing blowout for Untitled Goose Game over there at I Am 8-Bit. You can go to their store, check out all the stuff there. Use the promo code MinMax Show for 10% off anything in their store. And may we guide you towards the vinyl soundtrack for Untitled Goose Game, which is 100% recycled. The vinyl actually comes in a random color because it's recycled, which is a fun idea. Also, uh, you can buy the PS4 or Switch version of Untitled Goose Game. It's called Untitled Goose Game in a Box, and it is also coming from 100% recyclable materials, only available at im8bit.com. So show them some love. Use the promo code MINMAXSHOW because they're very nice for supporting us, and every week they ship something out from their amazing store. Uh, This week... We are going to choose our number one favorite question that somebody submitted, and then I Made Bits going to ship them out. The vinyl soundtrack uh, for Florence, one of my favorite Aww. games from a couple years ago. Uh, just incredible vinyl overall, an incredible soundtrack overall. So congratulations to whoever will win the vinyl soundtrack for Florence, uh, thanks to I Made Bit. Uh, should we get to community questions? Let's do it. Okay, first community question came from Alex Payne. He submitted a question on Patreon. He says, hello, Ben and the cohorts. Questions for you. (laughs) What are your thoughts on IGN doing a review in progress on Avengers? Well, I totally understand the thought behind it. It just kind of seems disingenuous to call it a review in progress, but have your first line state it is a demo. Also, I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but GOS is a bit overrated. What is GOS? Am I missing something? Games of service? Oh, that probably is what he's talking about. Oh, that's um, GAS. But this is a very insider thing. But yes, IGN posted their in-progress review of Avengers before the game is out. Uh, what do y'all think of that as a strategy for an outlet? I'm for it, man. Really? Like, I we, we used to have this debate at Game Informer sometimes. Like, I think the idea that something is, like, not allowed to be reviewed is absurd. I think, like, if it's available for the public to consume, you can share your thoughts on it. You can say whether you like it or not. Like, if you can ask a friend, like, should I take time to check this thing out, and you can give them an answer to that, then you can offer it. It's just because they they have the identifier of early access doesn't mean it can't be talked about in a critical way. Well, this is just the beta, though. Yeah. Even still, then can you can you tell me if the beta is any good? Can you review the beta? Can you but, say if I should play the beta? Yeah, but then it should be called Avengers Beta Review, not... Avengers the game review I mean in progress it just I guess uh, that's just kind of a semantics argument to me because I think the people the thing that people like that I'm seeing the discourse around is like you can't review it it's not released yet it's like but it's a thing that you can play like you can if it's something that you can if it's art that's I think, out in the Kyle, world I, that hey, you can Kyle, play and absorb like you can talk about it critically I get it yeah. I think your energy is coming from early access reviews which we're all on the same page about this feels like a different beast entirely of IGN just trying to get out there as early as possible for SEO reasons to be like this is the Avengers review we'll keep updating as we go yeah most of the discourse I've seen hasn't revolved around is this ready like is this the product that should be reviewed like is beta like can beta be reviewed it's like oh 
IGN is basically holding like Google real estate, right? Yeah. Um, before the game is out. And like my understanding with like a lot of other review copies is usually like you link to the products. Like the whole point is that like people are interested in like something that they can like then go consume, right? And so in, that's not the case with this. Um, I don't know. I think it's like, it is like a don't hate the player, hate the game. Cause like it's created, Google has created like a, a hor- essentially what is like a not great system for like disseminating news. Um, but at the same time, it's almost like, okay, if there were like an unspoken code of norms, it kind of seems like it's going against it. Um, it's like a yeah, little I think disingenuous. That's, yeah. I think you make a good point about like the sort of like, like you said, SEO real estate, but I do, I do, I I don't like the idea that people are like, I I just think that you should be able to talk about things critically no matter what. Yeah. Like, because you can play it like that. I don't know. I like that was, that was sort of my inkling was like, Mm. I I want to read people's opinion on the beta. I want to know. I I would like, I want to see those things. There's nothing wrong with that. I think people are just up, up in arms about calling it the review, but you're saying forget that impressions from the beta or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I also I also don't like the ID the review in progress I you know idea really? of just like yeah I I mean I can understand for some games when it, if it's like I guess to some extent a, a living game but it it also I I guess I have other issues with just review formats in general but but it it is I mean the the whole purpose is to get out there first with it yeah. and my mm-hmm. my initial impression seeing it was I'm glad I don't have to deal with that BS anymore <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean what are your thoughts on what reviews should be these days I know this is a longer conversation we've probably had a couple times before but you don't like the in progress so what do you do do you just wait and then just do a very old-fashioned very late review is it late though I think so I mean, by the time people will be able, well, I mean, depends on when I mean, Square game, turns a server on and stuff like that. It's certainly not late for Avengers at this point when it's not out yet. When is when is the release date for that game? Early September, September. September 4th, I think. Yeah. Publish it in I guess, September when, when the game comes out. <laughs> I think, Jeff, I like your point of calling it a beta review. Yeah. Like that's the thing that I'm hung up on is like I want to read someone's opinion about the beta. Like yeah. mm-hmm. and they're all over. Yeah. And I want it yeah. and yeah. I think it can be called be called a review. I think that's fine, but yeah. but I think you're right in that there is a little bit of like if you have Marvel's Avengers review, it is implied that it is the full game as opposed to the beta. But I yeah. but, so I think I think you're right in that word beta should be in there, but I do want that sort of content to exist. I want well, to see critical like, like, opinions. Imagine about like that every kind of time stuff a games journalist went to like an E3 and got like an hour with like a game or something like that or an event and they got an hour with a game and they're like, oh, cyberpunk review. Like I spent three hours. Like it just doesn't seem. It's a review in progress. We've started our (laughs) review now. It's, I mean, it's a slippery slope, but if IGN's breaking open the seal, that's where it's going, right? Is everyone's going to start, start trying to do that land grab of, okay, there was a technical alpha test for this game. So let's go ahead and call it the review in progress and then just update that shell. I mean, yeah. I feel kind of bad because, like, I've seen, like, editors and chiefs, like, from non-gaming websites, like, come out and be like, this is really bad practice. Which mm. I feel I feel kind of bad because I feel like a lot of this was started when, you know, like, one person called out another person. Um, and now it's just, like, out there. Um, but, like, apparently from, this is, like, editor-in-chief, or not editor, an editor at Gizmodo was like, oh, I hate it when games journalists do this. And it's like, oof, like, is that the reputation now, like, games journalism is getting in general, too? That's something that, like, is a little concerning as yeah. well. Um, it's nice, Jeff, um, with my Better Quest goal of limiting social media. This is for last <laughs> month, but I'm keeping it rolling. It's nice to not be as glued in to all that drama. It's so refreshing. <laughs> Even just, like, yeah. it was such a nice thing without getting political. But, like, just seeing, oh, I guess uh, Biden announced his running mate. I I don't have to see a single hot take on Twitter that well looking at that hot take is optional and it's a real stress reliever. Ugh. But okay, Ben, but I will say like I don't know, like sometimes I feel like I have to see things that are you know, like I like yeah. I feel I feel kind of like obligated to see some of those takes like even if it isn't like the most healthy thing for me like it's like kind of important, right? Like, yeah, it's I, I mean, it depends on where you're at in your career, struggle. for yeah. sure. 
Yeah, and it's definitely like a balance, but. Yeah. But you also super don't have to do it about video games. I, oh, I mean, I guess. I, you I, for I, not about yeah. SEO video games. Yeah. No, I 100% yeah. agree. I, I guess there yeah. are serious issues that we, we should yeah. stay up on, but yeah, when yeah. it comes to. Well, and like the last in thing is like that I'll say on this too, is like a study came out showing basically like illustrating that like journalists are very insular and not connected to wider audiences. And I think this is such a great example of that. Like this literally like does not like in the grand scheme of everything that's going on right now, I would argue that it does not matter. Um, <laughs> and it's I mean, kind of strange say that about video games for all of eternity. <laughs> But the, but this specific thing, like at yes, least in yeah. video games, you have like it is like a important piece of like pop culture. Um, but like with this, it's like oh, it's a bunch of big people online arguing about this, and now I'm going to explain this at dinner, and my boyfriend's like, I literally do not care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Spencer Routine gets back to almost the start of the show by saying, "Hey games, uh, hey gang, simple question." What the F am I going to play on my next-gen console this fall besides the blockbuster that I can already play on my current PS4 or Xbox? Help me rationalize spending $600. Uh, I don't think we can do that. I, <laughs> with Halo Infinite dropping, and even that one was murky and not necessary. Now it's like, eh. Especially, I'm still waiting for the shoe to drop if they announce that Spider-Man Morales Morales is playable on PS4 as well, which they have not said, but the fact that they haven't said PS5 exclusive, I'm hesitant to say it is going to be PS5 exclusive. Sure. I but mean, that would be my quick answer, would be Spider-Man. I mean, it, even if it does come to PS4, that will be the better version. Right. $600 yeah. better version or whatever these consoles the end question, up being? Probably not. Yeah. Unless you're a crazy person who is bad at money. Spencer, like yeah. Uh, you should spend all of your money on just upgrading your PC and then you'll be set. And you'll have to spend like twice that, but you'll have a great time. And then you won't get to play Spider-Man at all. That'll That's right. That's what we're here to help you with, Spencer. Uh, Grizzled Gaming... Simple question says, "Hey, Mini Mousers." That's right. Uh, ben, tell Jeff from Grizzle Gaming says hello. Hi. Uh, he'll know what it means. Hey, given all the facts we currently know about the Xbox Series X and the PS5, which product do you think will be better positioned out of the gate? Simple question. Simple I, I, answer. <laughs> I mean, I was probably leaning. Well, I might have been leaning Xbox. Before the Halo Infinite thing, just in terms of where they're sitting, I think PS5 well, is going to be more successful out of the gate. For months about you're a PC guy, like everything you've said has been like, well, I can just play it on PC, so I'm not that concerned about it. Right, right. Yeah, I think just I think overall for the console, I think what I've always said, I believe, is that I think PS5 is going to get out of the gate stronger. But Microsoft's long game of Game Pass, I think, will end up being more successful yeah. in the long run. Yeah. But at this point, yeah. with Halo dropping out, I think out of the gate it's undeniable that PS5 has an advantage now. I mean, we'll see what the price is, I guess. I mean, I, I think I think PS5 always had that advantage of having actual exclusives that you can only play on their console. And that that is going to rope in a bunch of people no matter what. I mean, even if we don't have a ton at launch, I feel confident in buying a PS5 because yeah. so many developers... Sony has so many first party developers that are making the kind of games that I want to play for that console. But I do think Game Pass is the interesting wrinkle where it's not so much about the console anymore for Microsoft and it's not about getting out of the gate and you know like having that mind share right at launch. It is a it is a much more long-term strategy that can pull in a lot more people and I think it's super appealing. Yeah. Uh, Tim Laro says this past week I've done the free trial for PS Now to check it out. I figure the only thing that could push me to Xbox is Game Pass, so I should see Sony's answer. My experience so far is that the library is smaller and older. You can only count on a couple somewhat recent releases to be available. Nevertheless, the streaming works great, and I've enjoyed testing out a dozen games this week. I plan to get at least one more month so I can finish Control and the Turing test. Do you think Sony will ever try to compete with Microsoft on the streaming front with PS Now? I was just going to bring that up on the tail end of the of the of that conversation about game passes that Sony pretty much kind of has that with PS now, but it, it is that difference between some games are, are streaming only and some you can actually download it. But, but it, that, that seems like an easy fix for them if they ever want to pivot that way too. Yeah, for sure. And so I wonder if they're waiting to see 
the reception towards the xCloud stuff around the launch of the Series X before they have their big lean into now it's all about PS Now because they promote PS Now but you know it's not exactly front and center for all their streams and stuff in a way that Game Pass is and xCloud with Microsoft and I I guess they would have to be willing to actually put all their first party games on there too yeah you know like as they launch right right which I think is a big selling point for Microsoft too but but you know it's it's an easy fix. It's it's not like they're starting from ground zero of like, oh no, what are we going to do now if if this becomes a huge success for Microsoft? They can turn that on pretty fast if they want to. <laughs> they already have it turned on. They just got to yeah. floor it. I mean, this is Sony also historically, like they're pretty good at taking ideas that other consoles are doing and, and integrating them after the fact, like motion controls with the six axis, um, trophies after achievements, uh, so I could see them sort of piggybacking off of that, doing their own thing, but a similar thing. You know? So it would be the equivalent of like the PS Move to the Wii of just like, technically we kind have of. streaming. That's kind of where PS Now is anyway right now, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you can even say VR, you know, it's like right. we looked at that as a trend and we're like, oh, we can do something like that, you know. <laughs> Sony's technically we've done it <laughs> rule, yeah. Well, yeah, and and also, I mean, I feel like the big draw of it is just don't even worry about the streaming part of it and just have it so that you can download these games. Yeah. And right. if you build out the library that way, I don't care if, if they can't, if their streaming can't compete with xCloud or not. I just want to download it anyway and play it, you know, at my leisure. Yeah. Leisure. Uh, Jim Tatterton says, Hey, Min Max, one thing I haven't heard about regarding Apple and xCloud, which by the way, uh, just for a bit of, Refresher, so xCloud's going to be launching, what, in beta or whatever it is on uh, Android phones in September, but Apple said, ah, we don't want you streaming Xbox games in there because we can't control what's on there. Anyways, Jim Chatterton writes in about it, saying, I haven't heard people talk about PlayStation Remote Play. The argument I hear behind Apple's decision is approving all games at xCloud is a store, not directly through the App Store. However, isn't this the same for PlayStation Remote Play? It's just that I own the machine that plays the game instead of Microsoft. That is like literally the only difference, and yet Apple still allows that app. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, yeah, you're streaming from your console in your home. Yeah, yeah, but where s- yeah. the other ones are, are remote servers. You yeah. know, isn't it weird that Apple makes that distinction though, or that they care about one and not the it other? Is. It is very weird. Yeah, and I, for what it's worth, like the PlayStation streaming, I've always had awful luck with. I was so eager about it and was so excited for it. Yeah, and I've never had it work very well, even with like sitting right in front of my system. Oh, that's so. a bummer. Uh, yeah. Ryan writes in and says, "Hello, cohorts. With next gen fast approaching and discussion brewing, the time has come upon us to rel- uh, to listen to the dreaded buzzword that no one really understands." Ray tracing, teraflops, parallax, Timothy Chalamet. Who can say what those things even are? I, for one, am tired of having to listen to what is essentially gibberish to get excited for something I may never know about. What are your least favorite next-gen buzzwords from past or present? And what can we do to stop their confusing reign of puzzlement? They will never end, Ryan. Uh, this, is, this is how this system works. This cycle has existed long before us and will exist long after us. Favorite next-gen buzzwords. What stands out for folks? Oh, favorite or least, least favorite. favorite? Yeah. Oh, uh, teraflops because I <laughs> I don't know what it is, and like every I I hear that it is actually like a good term to use. I also hear that it doesn't mean anything. Like teraflops isn't really a metric to measure things. Apparently, is what I've also heard. They just need and that just something. makes me so confused about it, and it sounds kind of gross. You know, the word flop is like never a good thing to like <laughs> relate to like having huh. a good computer system. So teraflops, I I I don't like it. One word that I am. It's not like a buzzword like, oh, I don't know what this is, but it's always, it's just like I'm really tired of hearing it is like immersion and like Mm. you're going to be so immersed. And I'm like, I've never, even in VR, I've never like played a game and like not thought that I like, you know, like if there was like a tornado or if there was like an earthquake, like I would know, right? Or if the TV turned off, I (laughs) I would know. I think you're taking immersion very literally, Anna. (laughs) Stop using, I know, but like stop you know, I get immersed when I read a book, but I don't have like every book publisher being like, you will be so immersed like when you read this book. Right, you know? right. Like there are other ways to describe like depth of the world, you know. It would be fun if like a book publisher was advertising like their different paper quality or something. Like this will make it 20% more immersive. <laughs> this font is unbelievable. You don't have to lick your fingers to turn these pages. Talk about immersion. <laughs> 
That's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not exactly next gen buzzy, but because uh, I think it was 2012 where they started talking about it. But just remember the whole smart glass thing? It it falls in that realm of just the stupid things that they are convinced that we really care about. And nobody within a hundred mile radius of me at any point ever cared about smart glass or the second screen experience, which I think was just that buildup of, oh, we're about to launch the next generation. And it seems like people are really into their phones. What do games do? Uh, connect it to the phone. And then, yeah, we're fine. Gaming's gaming, everybody. <laughs> we're fine. <laughs> Leave us alone. Or even in this realm, I think like, all every talk of connect is always just absurd every bit of microsoft pushing like it'll read your heartbeat it'll know what you had for <laughs> breakfast this morning it's like okay is that going to have an impact on anything that i do on any game that i played eh, no, no, not so much uh harjot alok writes in and says thinking about all the generations what are your favorite and least favorite controllers least favorite joy con by far what I mean, just the standalone drift, freaky joy con well, with drift and all right like yeah that's fair they've been very unreliable hardware i would say yeah and I, and they're really small like they're not they're not ergonomic at all right um, do you guys use the um the little slider extension pack thing i i never bother with those like just the little black thing that you can put on the side uh, I, my family plays Just Dance occasionally, and they'll put it on because it as a safety strap because yeah. they're dancing. Ah, so there we go. That's that's the advantage there. But um, yeah, I, I like the functionality of the Switch Joy Cons and splitting them apart. And like, mm-hmm. but they're not. Yeah, they're not. They they. I've had to send one off to get fixed, and it's frustrating for sure. Yeah, yeah. So least favorite controller uh, I, of all time? No, I least favorites tough i remember i actually did we did uh, in the magazine a game informer we did like a top i don't know i think we did like 50 controllers and i was like in charge of that feature and i remember like i we, i took a vote of everyone on staff and like dreamcast controller was just like so high and i was like you guys are insane like i do i hate the dreamcast controller. i, lo- I love the feel of the dreamcast controller really that hurts your hands out of yeah, all the, the retro controllers like, maybe it was maybe it was because i played shenmu which was kind of a funky not great experience but like the control stick doesn't feel good. My fingers cramped up with the sticks. I don't like the wire coming out of the bottom. It's coming out the wrong end. <laughs> like, well, the wire at the bottom is no doubt a bad idea. And I remember we talked to Yu Suzuki about that on that Shimu 3 visit. Uh, uh, and he said he he knew the reason why it was coming out the bottom, but he couldn't tell us. I was like, okay. <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> um, I li- it, It's freaky, and I understand it's kind of like a weird grip. It's like a deep slot in the back where your fingers are, but I love it. I love the weird little pimply analog stick. I like the Dreamcast controller. I, yeah, yeah. I like, when, when I'm when I'm looking for a good controller, I'm looking for pimply. <laughs> uh, oh. Just like a pimply, so you can make the most of the flops on the screen. It's very clear what gaming's all about, everybody. Uh, I, I Nintendo's gotten away from the octagonal uh, sort of controller thing with yeah. like the N64 and the GameCube, and and yeah, the Wii as well. I, I missed that. I liked that octagonal sort of thing, like especially for Galaxy because it could let you get you running in a straight line so mm-hmm. much easier and like consistently. So yeah. I'm, I'm bummed that they went with the sort of the round kind of 360 thing, but I guess it does give you more control ultimately. Yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, Jeff, do you have a favorite controller? Yeah, I mean, it's probably the Xbox one at this point. Yeah, I guess mine's... The Duke! I, I am a Duke defender, man. I like that Duke. I, I, I do too. I think I had four of them and I they were always fine. I don't know what everyone's complaining. Oh, it's so big. I can't. Oh. I, I don't have big. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine, everybody. Uh, Sometimes you have to reach over to get to the black and white buttons, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever. Josh it's stretching. That's right. Josh Labaz says, how do cohorts? Is Steam going to have to have dual sense support soon after launch? Will the DualSense work on PC easily like Xbox controllers? With Sony publishing on PC and PlayStation Now being on PC, isn't this in their best interest? Yes. I haven't thought about that. But yeah, I wonder if... God, if other developers then can take advantage of the haptics in the DualSense for like their Steam games and stuff. Yes. I mean, you can plug in like a, a Switch controller, but there aren't really a lot of like Steam games that use motion controls really like same with the Wii, right mm-hmm. it's yeah cool. I, I hope they do but i don't i don't know i don't think that happens a lot yeah so i'm sure it'll support it but yeah i'm curious about, about the full 
functionality or even like the microphone on there, you know, who knows? Um, Zach writes in and says, Hey, Anna, na 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 I just wanted to say I really like the Pokemon episode of Refresh, the last episode you did with Gussie Lewin. Uh, I've been reading Cerebi, Smogon, and Bulbapedia for more than half my life now, so it's interesting to hear discussions about all those types of sites. Although I was flabbergasted by the Frostlass betrayal. Frostlass is the best. All right. I, I'm torn. I am multiple favorites. What can I say? So, Got to kick it to the curb. Sorry, Frostlass. Um, Daniel Dwiggins says, who will be the next character to join the ranks of Mario, Sonic, Pac-Man, Link, etc. as an uber-recognizable blue blood of gaming? What franchise can break through that barrier of being mentioned with those classics next? A Fall Guy. Yeah, and... that's what I was going <laughs> to say. Bean. Well, this made me think of like, do you think Epic blew it? And everybody knows that Epic's really blown it over the last 10 years, but... Do you think they blew it by not having, like, a signature character for Fortnite? I think so, yeah. Because that could be up at that level if there was just, like, yeah. the go-to Fortnite the person. But it's just, yeah. it's a little all over the place. Yeah, you know, like, I think that might uh, be us being old people. I think, like, I think kids would rather just have a character that they can call their own. Like, well, I think they would prefer that. I don't no. think they want a mascot, necessarily. Well, yeah, but just for the marketing. Just having, you know, obviously you can still create your own character. That's such a huge part of that game. But just having the face of Fortnite is like a pickaxe and a bus. Yeah, I mean, obviously marketing has not been a problem for that game. So they're doing something right. But there are, there are I mean, they sell toys. There are elements that are very Fortnite-ish. There are strange characters within that Fortnite bubble. Yeah, There's like the cat and like yeah. the weird, but but I do I totally see what you guys are saying. There's not like a singular character that you're like, oh, that's Fortnite, you know? Because right. like even as far as kids go, I feel like it's been very helpful for Minecraft to have like their creeper characters mm-hmm. and you know like even Steve, like those I think staples. it's a mileage. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Minecraft <laughs> like to sell toys and to be recognizable like brand, you know, representatives of the brand, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. is anything going to join this league of Daniel Dwiggins uh, characters then? I mean, I, I think what's tough about that is that so many of them end up being cartoon characters. Or, you know, like even Mario and Link, I think part of that appeal is like having a very cartoony aesthetic to it. Yeah. And we just don't, I mean, what you have like Lucky's Tale. I'm sure Nintendo could come up with something with another character like that. You know, like a Pope, yeah. like... Like they did with Pokemon, that kind of... Well, that's an interesting thing. Even the Inklings, how I think about it, like that's also a little bit diffused about having multiple Inklings and there's, Mm -hmm. you know, Kali Mari. It's like, those are a little bit all over the place as well. I think it's just in this era now when people want customization and options, it's tough to have the singular character. Plus, I remember talking to Mark Cerny about Knack before it came out about whether or not it's going to be a mascot. And I remember he had the interesting take of, oh yeah, video games don't need mascots anymore because everybody knows what a video game is. Mascots were just like the Mm -hmm. Trojan horse to introduce people to the concept of video games. And so maybe that's one of the reasons that we don't see a character rise to that level. I mean, what is the last character that was in that pantheon? Pikachu. I mean, maybe like a Ratchet, Clank, or Jack and Daxter, I mean, maybe? This is like the Kratos Master yeah. Chief of that generation, but eh, yeah. more recent than what that. About, what about like a Spyro? Yeah, 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 I like Crash. Spyro, but that's still that earlier generation. Still but earlier. I mean, over the last two generations, Nathan Drake, I guess. Yeah. Okay, um, not like the same level and not the same recognition, but like a huge fan base is like Joker is a new character who's like very specific to a game. Well, yeah, yeah but that's not like, definitely yeah. not the same echelon, but like one of the only. Oh, you're saying mascots. Persona. Huh? Yeah. Persona Joker. Yeah. Oh, okay. The DC okay. Character. Or right. like, what about um, this? Maybe this defeats my whole argument. But who, the character from Undertale, whose name I'm I'm, I'm oh, trying to blank on right now. Sans. What's that? Sans. Sans. Yeah. Like maybe him. He's got the jacket. He's pretty iconic. He's like pretty easy to recognize. He's starting to sort of go mainstream. Yeah. You know? He's I'll in let... Smash Brothers. But I don't know? think he'll uh-huh. get any higher. But he was like really yeah. popular in memes and like younger kids do know Sans because hmm. of like the weird culture around him. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, let us know. Leave a comment with who you think could ever join that Pantheon, please. Real quick, have any of you guys watched um, that Seth Rogen movie, uh, American Pickle? No. <laughs> what is this? 
There's a scene in that movie where Seth Rogen's in a bar and like Knack is like playing in the background. Yeah. Like, that's weird. I saw people obsessed with that. Yeah, I don't know why. It's just like an inside joke. If it is, it's diabolically smart to put I mean, the I most confusing in like a, game. A barcade, maybe? Mm. But even that, like, because there's an arcade machine behind it, but it's like on the yeah. TV, it's like very clearly like Knack is being played. And you gotta imagine that Seth Rogen knows his games. Like, Knack. A, yeah, he's a gamer guy. I don't know. Weird. And he's a gamer guy. Um, he's a gamer guy. Jonathan says, Hello, Min Maxologist. I signed up to Patreon specifically, specifically to respond to your Caterpillar discussion on last week's show. Jonathan. Oh, great. Thank Jonathan, you. hero. I'm a research biologist at the University of Nottingham and completed my PhD last year. I can absolutely confirm that a caterpillar is the same animal as the butterfly it becomes, and the same with tadpoles and frogs. <laughs> Anna, I'm sorry, you're so confused. Caterpillars and tadpoles are what you would call larval forms of the animal, but they are still the same species, have the same underlying, underlying DNA, and to your point, Hansen would appear on the same point on the tree of life. More detail if interested. While Jeffen was right about the caterpillar dissolving its body during metamorphosis, groups of organized cells called imaginal discs are maintained, which serve as a foundation upon which the butterfly body is constructed. Even still more detail, when tadpoles first hatch, they have external gills and as such are generally restricted to water. For most amphibians, these gills become non-functional during metamorphosis and are absorbed back into the body and replaced with lungs, causing the animal to require air to breathe. The animal would be classified as an amphibian throughout its life as amphibians are a taxonomic group. I hope that covers your question in sufficient detail. From Nottingham, UK. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Yeah. Also, Thanks for paying us to answer our question. <laughs> it's really quite a system we <laughs> have here. Good. Uh, <laughs> Alex, that's a, that's we incredible. have to be that's stupider, guys. So <laughs> that's it. Uh, I think we got that covered. Uh, Alex Kinman and Matt Robinson both wrote in about this. Uh, they bring up a Wired article from 2008. So uh, Alex here says, after watching last week's show, I have a bit of insight on the Caterpillar con- conversation, as I'm a bit of an expert because I watched the documentary. Uh, more <laughs> interesting than the fact that they turned to goo in the metamorphosis to moth and the metamorphosis to moth is the fact that they retain memories. So scientists taught caterpillars to not like certain smells by exposing them to smells and then giving them a gentle shock. Then after the whole goo cocoon business, they retain that memory and will avoid the smell as a moth. Isn't that awesome? So they know. Yeah, right that's down, wild. Goo cocoon. That's just a good name for like a band or something. <laughs> You're writing that down? <laughs> it's perfect. But yeah, there's an but article the, from So they definitely it. remember being a creepy long caterpillar once they become a butterfly and then they're like oh man this is way better that's i can fly be around nice. now and stuff do you think it's fear that they feel first or is it exhilaration about oh my god my life was building to this moment and now i'm so happy i'm not that stupid thing crawling around anymore it's probably hun- hunger is that an emotion well <laughs> no they're only hungry hungry if they're a caterpillar oh right <laughs> please everyone stand down please <laughs> relax at home um, Jordan Edmond says, does, or asks, does Jeffem have any tips for explaining board game rules in a clear and concise manner? I always hear complaints that I'm long winded and talk in circles when I explain rules to others. Yeah, that's, you're always going to get that. Sorry. People are just jerks when you have to explain a game to them. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it, the best, well, the best advice I can give you is that shut, shut up and sit down. Um, put together a video of like how to teach board games that we can link to. But, but basically like you want to go over the rules before everyone shows up to figure out how to play by yourself. Yeah. And then, and then I think one easy tip is when you're giving examples of stuff, like incorporate the people at the table into those examples and say like, so if Hanson moves his character here, then he, you know, this is what happens as opposed to just keeping it the ambiguous That's of good. like, if you go here, then this happens. But otherwise, yeah, it's, it's always going to be a slog if you're, if you're playing a more complicated game. And where do you stand on the, cause I, you can get lost just trying to explain this stuff. I think it's important to get the board out as quickly as possible, walk through it physically as quickly as possible. Where do you stand on the practice round, Jeff? Um? Uh, it's, it's certainly good when you can, when it's a game that facilitates that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. The verdict's in everybody. If, if, if games have rounds like that. Yeah. And, and I also, I also 
don't mind there there are some situations where you can just explain stuff as they go where it's like okay we're gonna have these mission cards we can go over them you know once they start coming out instead of trying to go over all the abilities but but if it's if it's something that has to be incorporated into the strategy then people can can get upset about that if you if you say why didn't you explain this to me earlier but at that point, you say, hey, you know what? Here's the rule book. You do it yourself next time. Right, right. Is my uh, approach. I feel like I pulled off a miracle by getting my parents who are very, they like playing games, but very simple stuff. Like sequence is like their game. They love sequence. But I got them into uh, Catan, which feels like yeah. a real Hail Mary. Is that a Monopoly deal? I, I pulled it off. A twofer. Uh, there you go. Muffin Crumbs writes in and says, Hey, Ben and crew. Growing up, I used to scroll through our local newspaper, and sometimes I would come across a monthly horoscope article. I used to always think, Who the hell actually believes in this garbage? Well, just the other day, I was sitting with my fiance when she suddenly said, Hey, let's look at our horoscopes. I was amused as she read mine since it didn't describe me at all, but then was blown away when she was legitimately confused as to how it was incorrect. What are your opinions on horoscopes? Do you believe in them? Who even comes up with them? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question i don't know who's writing these things that's, i don't know um, I, uh, I think they're fun i don't believe in them but I, I think they're fun to read yeah i think like my stance on horoscopes is that they like yes one that they're fun and then two like if they're like a meaningful way for you to like help understand yourself you know and like help you sort of like make sense of like your friends or the world around you whatever then like they're fine i think they're funny because like so many times like they are so ambiguous so it's like wait that could be anyone but then like if the person responds to certain things in that they're like oh this is definitely this this is and it's like okay then it's like fine it's helping you like see things in your life you know right right and there's those you know classic scientific tests of you know uh, making it so uh, whatever the blind test so it's like you raise your hand if you think this horoscope relates to you and then everybody raises their hand because they're always so ambiguous everybody relates to it so i don't believe in them but i do think like you mentioned it's a fun way to like reflect on your life you know just to have that moment of oh okay this kind of makes sense maybe i should go in this direction so no harm done unless you're way too into them like one of my sisters is way too into them and that will drive me insane <laughs> does everybody have yeah. like those signs that people really put a lot of weight in like for me it's always like oh oh yeah he's a taurus all right you can yeah. tell like that's like the family thing is like oh another taurus look at this does everybody have that <laughs> is it always taurus i don't know i always I just scorch, but i don't know what that means like that's the one that sticks out to me but Gemini seems very common theme in rap. <laughs> like, in rap? Yeah, like it's always like a thing is like if you're like with a Gemini. <laughs> um, I don't know. Huh. Yeah. I had no idea. Uh, but everybody knows that Jeffum is a Sagittarius. Well, see, th this is why I don't like horoscopes because I was always a Scorpio, but I was on the cusp. Mm -hmm. And then at one point I checked the newspaper like years later and they had me classified as something else because like the date somehow they changed the dates on them i'm like what you can't change the dates <laughs> math is math wait don't you guys remember too it was like six years ago there was that headline about yeah now there's a new horoscope oh yeah that? there's there were they added the 13th yeah Sorry. is that still a yeah. thing that's a good I question. <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe this is an episode of Refreshed. Yeah, that, Ooh, that'd be that fun. was like what happened that. happened to the 13th horoscope <laughs> on? I, I think that was like that the one person who writes horoscopes was like starting to worry about their job security and was like, gotta <laughs> shake it up somehow. Like, we need the expansion pack of horoscopes. <laughs> What's it gonna nine. be? Yeah, but then no one bought the DLC, so it just fades over time. Uh, <laughs> Chris Culkins. Hmm, not Macaulay, writes in and says, I'd like you all to rate the strangeness of this coincidence. Remember a while ago when we were rating coincidences, like oh, yeah. five months ago? There? All right, here we go. In the first fable, you start as a kid in the small village of Oakvale in the forest of Albion, and after tragedy strikes, you're taken to the Heroes Guild. For the first seven years of my life, I lived on Oak Orchard Road near the town of Albion, New York, and in the summer of 2001, my family moved away because my dad was going back to college and we lived in an apartment on the campus. Also, the game starts on your sister's birthday and I started Fable Anniversary last Tuesday, which was my sister's birthday. I think that's like a... Pretty coincidental. 5.5 5 out of 10? 
it seems fine. Yeah. yeah Oak Vale. Okay. Oak Orchard Road could be closer. The Albion is clearly your your you're hanging your hat on Albion, which is good. But, you know, we want better coincidences yeah, right. for people to write in about. And, and I mean, did he know that he was starting it on his sister's birthday? Yeah. Yeah, they yeah, waited. Did he just line, was he lining that up himself to make this a better <laughs> so story? That's my No one knows. Hey. No one knows what Chris is doing. The world works in mysterious ways, as they say. No. Uh, Sean Mason <laughs> writes in and says, Recently, my friends and I were discussing running. And one of them brought up that they haven't run at full speed using maximum effort since college. My question to you is, when is the last time you ran at full speed? Uh, last summer was after we got laid off, I started jogging. And, th- and that, was, that was like the actual fun part about it was just like sprinting, like doing the Tom Cruise sprint for as long <laughs> as I could. Like that, that is just so That's satisfying not jogging, to Jeff, to do. It is. Um, I've been trying to get my mile time down, so I sprinted yesterday. Do you, um, do you think, but sprint versus peaking, like you physically cannot run faster. Oh, don't you think there's a difference like there? my fastest, no, I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't think I could get back to where I was like in high school. Well, not even, not even that. It could be just your current maximum speed though. Yeah, I was, I was running at my current maximum speed, right? Like. Isn't that what a sprint is? You run as fast as you can? I, I think sprint is just like a, a, a loose classification of faster than a jog. But I, I define it as like sprint versus I'm talking like burying the needle on a sprint. I feel like that's that's what we're getting at here with Sean. Yeah. Burying the needle? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like a mind implosion. Yeah. It's like oh. when you really punch it, you know? No, mind consumption, Kyle. Push it. No, like it. If in a race, like you're running at a different speed if you're sprinting versus if you're in a hundred yard race trying to yeah. run faster than somebody, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. that's yeah. fair. I, I yeah. mean, it is, you have to imagine Tom Cruise in the Mission Impossible yes. movies yep. and yep. run as fast okay. as you can to the point where you, it, like, like you can feel your, your face How, what distance? muscles moving what as distance? you're like stomping just yeah. as long as you can. And then you give up. It, it would right. be like half a block for me. And then I'd be. Huffing okay. On the side or until of the you side. shatter. I'll, I'll try this. I'll try this. And, and then, yeah. you know you're done when you've broken your ankle on the side of a building. There we go. That's, that's <laughs> and then they leave it in the movie. Oh, uh, th- yeah. I did it. Uh, I did, ran at my max speed maybe a month ago. Uh, I was on a football field with my friend Grant, the chef from Min Snacks, and uh, somehow the idea of a race got brought up. Maybe it was me. Um, and we raced, and I really thought I could beat him because my legs are longer. And then I believe that he crushed me. So mm. there we go. That was me giving it my all. Uh, Rushdan Majunder wrote, writes in and says, what positive changes have you made during this quarantine that you otherwise would not have? Running. <laughs> I run every day now. That's perfect. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it on Better Quest a lot, but I've gotten into running as well, but then I effed up my IT band. And so oh. now I need to stop running for a bit and let it heal. And then turns out you need to like stretch before and after running, which I thought was just like an old wise mm-hmm. tale. Mm-mm. Turns out uh, you actually need to do that or you'll hurt yourself, which I learned the hard way. Well, I've From got some good uh, IT band stretches for you, Hanson. Really? You're interested. Yeah. Uh, I was looking them up. There's a lot of weird ones. There's one where you kind of like clamshell your legs and make mm-hmm. a bridge. Is it that type of stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have some stand ones you can do standing as well. Like... Which are fun if you have something, you know, to balance on because you need to be on one foot. But. Yeah. Do you use Strava? Mm-hmm. What's that? Uh, it's like an app for tracking running. That's what I was using oh. for like, tracking my speed and you stuff. You know, I'm actually I'm actually looking for a better app because I've been using um, Under Armors and I don't think it's like super accurate, like the distancing. The way okay. It does it. I don't know how Strava would so, compare, but I know that folks in uh, the Better Quest channel on Discord, uh, they have like a communal Strava thing, so you can actually oh, that's sign awesome. up there. And yeah, it seems fun. Oh, maybe I'll join that. Yeah. Uh, Brian Paradis says, with the announcement of Suicide Squad and the upcoming release of Avengers, I wanted to know, what do you want from your comic book games? Do you want an original story, an adaptation of an existing story, multiple playable characters, or a more focused experience like Spider-Man? Uh, yeah, I like uh, a good focused. focused yeah. Adapt. Loose adaptation. Like, I think, like, you can have, like, um, like, original story, but based on, like, the bones of a popular comic, I think, work for me. Yeah. And then you get all kinds of fun references and, like, familiar bosses and stuff like that. But I do like original stories. Yep. And singular character 
I would always lean that That's way. That's my preference. And yeah. I would prefer very early on with them learning their powers. It just makes way more sense for the progression of a game, right? Like, obviously, Spider-Man's great. He's kind of at the peak of his powers in that game. But I like that progression of being barely able to jump. You know, the John Carter of Mars progression, I believe they call it, Kyle. I don't know if I like... I love that in, a, like, a, a movie. But in a game, I kind of want to just, like, be, like ready to go like i want to be batman in arkham asylum i've been batman for a while i've been spider-man for a while it's just a matter of like just getting the the button prompts i don't think i want a tutorial where it's like oh my gosh i just became a spider-man you know <laughs> yeah which Try is, to a, figure which out is a familiar line that's in every spider-man movie everybody you know? knows it yeah i guess it is telling that they had a game called arkham origins and even that was like year two of batman like it's like there's no fun for actually batman getting beat up in the alley over and over again <laughs> Like, yeah, the opening, it's like, yeah, well, let's watch your parents die and then, you know, go get your ass kicked. For uh-huh. Take some years. respects. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mick Manga writes in and says, so I've been thinking, it's been a while since video games took off as an entertainment medium for media. And since then, we've had the rise of user-created content like YouTube and Twitch take off. But I've been sitting here trying to imagine what might be next for the big new form of entertainment. Well, VR seems promising. It really hasn't hit mass market yet. So I asked the computer-loving cohorts, what do you see as the next big form of entertainment? Or has all new forms of entertainment been discovered? I love this question. I mean, yeah. people are spending billions of dollars to try to answer this question. You know, like, well, what do you think it is, Kyle? I don't know. One-on-one I, on one interaction. I think it's <laughs> like... <laughs> how do you monetize a conversation? I feel like podcasts are monetized conversations in some ways. I guess that's I don't true. Know. Just uh, more realistic, like, interpersonal discussions with people. I don't know. Yeah. What are know. you talking like about? AI that you can actually talk to and have a real conversation with maybe or something. And that's like a that. whole new field. That is, like, the equivalent of video games or radio or TV to that level. Yeah. Like, you can buy George Washington and have a discussion with him mm. or something. Do you think VR falls into the video game umbrella? Or is VR fair to call its own unique thing? You know... I think it's like 70% video games, but the fact that they are exploring other entertainment mediums with, within that platform, like there are short films and movies that you can watch in VR. I think that yeah. makes it edge a little bit out of video games, but still mostly yeah. video games, I think. Yeah. I think for what McManga is looking at, I think it's just going to be that full AR immersion. It's going to be the Matrix will be the next big thing when you can just scan the environment and then do whatever you want fully one-to-one. Yeah. I think um, it's going to be the floating chairs from Wally. Yep. That's the next form of entertainment. We're all going to be <laughs> really into customizing our chairs. Everyone's going to be talking about the chairs. It's going to be more profitable than the video game industry. It's just the chair <laughs> industry. I mean, what was um, the Joaquin Phoenix, Spike Jones movie, Her? Yeah. He, I mean, he had that video game that was like a big projection that just like took over his whole room. Right. He wasn't looking at it through a screen. And that, that actually which is funny now that that comes to mind because he was having a conversation with an AI in that video is. game. Like mm-hmm. that's how that game worked. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's, maybe it's something along that. I, no. I like it, the idea of projection, like taking over a large portion of a room to so be like, like a AR, video but that's almost. just a video yeah. game, Kyle. Like AR. That, I don't know if that's the right term though, because it's like actually, you know, projecting exactly. in your home yeah. as opposed to looking through something augmented, you know, I don't know. That's all cool, but it's it's gonna be some like dumb TikTok kind of thing where it's That's like. That's what I was gonna say. The future's already here. It's like yeah, the, it, it it's gonna be future, some yeah, it's gonna be some weird format that none of us. It's gonna be like Quibbly or something like Quibby. that kind of thing of like but not Quibby. Yes, but not that one. Quibbly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's someone's gonna come up with an app where you randomly talk to some celebrity for five seconds or something, then I they think get that's, electric shock. Wait, but something. that kind that's, of exists already. Um, have y'all cameo. heard of Cam... Yeah, Cameo. Incredible. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Boy, have I heard of Cameo. Hang on. Let me find... <laughs> I keep trying to get Hanson to like use MinMax money to just buy Cameo plugs for MinMax, but he doesn't yeah, want we to. should. Um, <laughs> Hang on, we can hire Nolan North. To- <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, have I talked to you about this? I, in Slack, I think once I put a link to Nolan North's a Cameo account, and I was like, "Hey, come on, let's throw some money." But I didn't, just to be clear, <laughs> to see how affordable some celebrities are. I was very into Cameo months back 
And this is my own <laughs> personal money, just to be clear. I'm not using the Patreon money for this. But I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get the weirdest, cheapest celebrity. Like, who can I get the most bang for the buck with on Cameo yeah, to record what I thought would be fun to make an end screen for MinMax that I could put on the YouTube channel? Like, yeah, this is going to be perfect. Talking about this. Oh, great. I was like, this is going to be perfect. So I scoured through all of Cameo to figure out, like, who is the best? Because... You know, Pendulet will be like 250 bucks, stuff like that. Dan Reichert's 30 bucks, which is outrageous and, and way too high. Uh, went through, <laughs> and in terms of just face recognition versus price, for $30, I found uh, Larry Hankin, who is Mr. Heckles, like the downstairs neighbor from Friends. He's the old <laughs> guy that runs like the... Um, okay. uh, the dump oh, from oh. Breaking Bad. He's the bad guy in... Happy Gilmore. He's the alternate Kramer in Seinfeld for the casting of the show. He is like, right, he's right. the ultimate that guy, and he was only 30 bucks. And so I paid him and said, hey, can you plug the deepest dive for MinMax? And uh, he sent back a video explaining, yeah, well, hey, I'll put the video in now. You can hear it, see it for yourself. Hey, MinMax, commercials cost a fortune, but I don't do commercials. Get your money back. Uh, but yeah, it turns out that that's a separate, there's a separate ad fee and that you can't just have people oh. record it in screen. It's a whole separate thing. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. But uh, Larry Hankin, ladies and gentlemen, friend of the show, <laughs> dear, dear friend of the show. Um, let's see. Oh, Mason Cowell writes in and says, Hey, Hansonites, today I want to talk about your best and worst completion rates with various game series. For example, my best completion rate is probably Pokemon with 12 for 12 completed games, whereas my worst is maybe Fallout with zero of three games I've played in the series being completed. What about you? What's your highest and lowest completion rate by series? Hmm. I mean, Zelda's probably up there. Huh? Call of Duty's probably surprisingly high, I would bet. For, right, personal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's surprising. Call of Duty, I guess. Yeah. Zelda's definitely my highest because I've beaten every one. So Above Pokemon even? Yeah, because um, Pokemon, I didn't finish Black and White 2 and I didn't finish the second version of uh, Sun and Moon, whatever that was, Alpha Sun and whatever. Right, Moon. right. So like those... Spinoffs, if you're counting those. The like, sequels, yeah, they're kind of murky. Yeah, I, that's yeah. tough. Because, yeah, I finished every mainline Pokemon except for just black and white. I never finished those original ones. I've tried starting those so many times. But Pokemon's probably my number one ratio for ongoing series. I guess it doesn't count if there's like, oh, there's two entries. Who cares, you know? Yeah. Jeffum, the old timer, what do you got? I'm thinking of Call of Duty now that Kyle said it. Otherwise, I was going to say maybe Halo. Oh, okay. Just because you've finished I, everyone? Yeah. Not I Red think, Dead? Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm 50%, <laughs> which, is better, which is better than a lot of series. Well, oh, 33%. Where, yeah, where's Red Dead? Um, Revolver. Revolver sitting there, yeah. I'm at 33%. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you know Matt, my lowest my my might be Kingdom Hearts because I have played a lot of them, but two's the only one I've beaten. Mm. And there we a go. Lot of those. Uh, James Smith submits a comment on Patreon. He says, "Hey Spyro and the Hansons and the Co Norks, yeah, you got it. Um, how many community questions do you think you've answered so far in your lives, and do you think we'll ever run out of new ones?" I mean, thousands and thousands at this point. It have to be with all that stuff on the Game Informer show. Yeah, it's an overwhelming amount. And I'm always amazed that there are new ones. I always think, like, I think I've answered everything I could possibly answer. Not only this, but then you think about MinFax, our weekly Patreon exclusive podcast, where it's also just more community questions. Turns out, yeah, there's just an endless amount. We're never going to run dry. Um, and I don't care how many people ask, hey, if you could have a film adaptation of one video game series, what would you like it to be? You know, there's like those questions that come in all the time, but there's always new yeah. stuff. Um, like, hey, here's a bunch of new ones. Um, Cody Hester writes in and asks, hey folks, is there a more satisfying action than pulling a plant from the ground and having the roots come with it? No, that is probably the most satisfying thing on planet Earth, and uh, we've never been asked that before, so that's great. Uh, Matthew <laughs> Clark asks, are Battle Royale games just competitive roguelikes in a trench coat? 
Yes, they are <laughs> competitive roguelikes if you think about it. Uh, Charles Davis writes in saying, asking, hey, if the fountain of youth can make you live forever, can you drown in it and still die? Uh, never, yeah. I think yeah. you can too. Yeah. Yeah, because it's just Cause stopping the aging process, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, well, that's hit, an be hit by one. a bus. You're not immortal. Yeah. Well, it depends on your, I think, fountain of youth rules probably, but the normal is that you're not mortal. Um, and then Bucket of Jello writes in with a killer community question, just to prove your point that they're never endless here. Uh, Bucket of Jello asks, is a bowl of lettuce a salad? Yeah. It is. It absolutely yeah. is. Yeah. It that's, feels... That's my kid's favorite salad. That's what she loves to eat. <laughs> that's, just, that's just a bowl of lettuce, though. Yeah, it's a bowl that's of lettuce. A, you're not saying that's a salad? If I said... Hey, do you want a salad and I give you a bowl of lettuce? Like you would, you would not. No, I would, I would look at that Hanson and I would say, that's a bowl of lettuce. Give <laughs> that, me a second ingredient. That is a salad. Wait. No, but is you it mean at least. Like are, are you, are, are, are they different types of lettuce at least? Okay. Here's the, here's the test. Here's the test. You are meeting your uh, girlfriend's parents for the first time. You're going over there for dinner. It's a very tense, weird situation, which I imagine it was. Uh, they say, hey, Jeff, Jeff, um, as they'd call you, would you like a salad with your dinner? And you say, yes, please. And then they give you a nice plate of pasta or whatever, and then just a bowl of lettuce for the salad. You would not raise a stink. You would just eat that's, that lettuce and shut up. But if they that's just being lettuce, polite. That, yeah. that doesn't have anything to do with yeah. the core definition no, of what not, a salad it's is. it's not. Yeah. If they, they brought out a bowl of Fruit Loops in front of you yeah, and you'd be like, yeah, thank you for this no, salad, that's my a, girlfriend. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. See, if they brought out the Fruit Loops, that's exactly my point. You'd say, what is this? And then you'd <laughs> throw the bowl against the... No, you'd question, this isn't a salad, but I'm saying a bowl of lettuce close enough to a salad where it is a salad and you would just move close on. Close enough, but you, I mean, you just said close enough that means it's not, though. It is. There's still a distinction there. A salad needs at least a second ingredient or a dressing on it for yeah. it to be a salad. No. What about a bowl of lettuce with a little bit of leftover water from the cleaning process? Is that two no. ingredients? No. Mm. Kyle, what are you doing to your kid, man? <laughs> yeah, you need to feed <laughs> your kid. She loves lettuce. What can I tell you? We all love yes, lettuce. Yes, she loves lettuce, not salad. Yep, there you go. Hey, kids are picky eaters, man. I think you're wrong, guys. Um, Sam Kamiski says, imagine that you're transported back to the Middle Ages. Let's say the 1400s. You possess all of your modern knowledge, but none of your modern possessions. What skills slash information could you impart on these medieval people? Does the modern man know anything practical? Uh, Be happy uh, for what you have now. That's what you would impart? <laughs> it gets worse somehow. <laughs> the 1400s, it's really There's, peak um, civilization. <laughs> just, a, I, I guess it's a plug, but like one of my favorite current comedians is this guy, Nate Bargatze. He has a, he has a half hour special and an hour on special on Netflix. I highly recommend checking him out, Nate Bargatze. And he has a Comedy Central special where he talked about this whole idea. Yeah. And how absolutely useless he would be if he went back in time. Right. Like, nothing <laughs> would transfer. Like he would be like the joke that he has is like you would see someone talking on a payphone and you'd be like, hey, you know, someday you're going to be able to carry those around in your pocket. And they'll be like, oh, really? How does that work? It's like, I don't know, satellites. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, there's, I don't know. I, I really don't think I would have anything that I could like bring forward. Maybe, maybe like an interesting dish that they wouldn't like a, a f cooking of some kind. Be like, mm. Did you ever think of cooking it this way? And like, I can make like you a mean salad. Yeah. And pancakes. Or, yes. Or something like that. But that's about it. I, I mean, there, I think there's some basic hygiene and like health yeah. related stuff that you yeah. could pass on of like germs. Wash your hands. Surgeons that's it. To wash their hands. In the 1400s, yeah. 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 You'd go yell practice. at Merlin or whatever and just say, hey, everybody, it's important to wash your hands. And they probably wouldn't believe you and they'd probably just throw a rock at your face or something. So you I really mean, couldn't do much. That's literally happened. That's literally what happened when there were people who said, hey, surgeons, we need to start washing our hands before this. They decried it and it was this huge battle and the person who was fighting for it got like kicked out of the doctor's guild or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> You're out of the doctor's guild. How yeah, dare you tell us to wash our hands? Let's see. So I remember in uh, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, I remember what he does is he like puts a lightning rod on one of the towers. So then it gets struck by lightning and explodes and they all think that he's magical. But that's not that cool. That's like, I think that's the coolest thing that guy does in that book. And meh. He has a, in the movie, he had like a CD player that he was able to get the laser 
to like shoot out of the the little portable CD player. And that oh. always bugged me as a kid because it's like that's not how CD players work. You can't. It's not a laser that you can like display to people. <laughs> Would that not work? Anyway. That's an interesting idea. So if you remove the disc, could you it, like it, it? Basically, imagine like it, like the, it's the difference between a laser pointer and like a laser that scans the CD. Like they're different. They're functionally different. It doesn't actually create a red dot. Uh, as, far as I know, that's I could never get it to work that way. And what did the Black Knight do? Martin Lawrence, Maybe. what was his greatest trick uh, of all? Jokes. Uh, a lot of jokes. Just jokes. He slayed them with jokes. He slayed the entire army. Uh, I need to read Michael Crichton's timeline. I've never seen that movie. I've never read that book, but I bet that's a super fun version of that story. Are you also... Like, I love... I've not read Timeline either, but I love stories about people displaced in time from the past coming to the future. Yeah. Like Kate and Leopold. That's what American Pickle is about, that Seth Rogen movie. Right. Is it good? So... There's there's a scene I absolutely love in that movie where the man from the past, hundred years old, yeah, like drinks a carbonated drink for the first time th- that I love. Just the idea of like how would a person from a hundred years ago react to like homemade carbonated drinks? Like if the whole movie was like that, I would have loved it. But uh, it's it's funny though. I would recommend it. Okay, uh, I, Shiv from Succession is in there. In in that movie, mm-hmm. it's uh, Seth Rogen's wife. Oh, really? Yeah. Guess wait, so. like, I... Are, oh, no, in the movie. In the movie, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for a second, I was like, wait, so in real life? <laughs> nah, not quite. Uh, Jacob L. says, Hey, Mins and Maxes, uh, I've recently gotten to playing Bleeding Edge on Game Pass, and I'm really enjoying it. The gameplay is tight and engaging, while not as stressful as Overwatch or Valorant. Sadly, I can't stop thinking about how small this game's community is, and that will affect its longevity as an online multiplayer game. Bleeding Edge usually never has more than 10 or 15 viewers on Twitch. Oh, boy. Uh, and its subreddit is only a couple thousand people. So my question is, do you have any tips or, for individuals like me to help support the game that I'm playing? Should I just keep screaming about it at the top of my lungs on Twitter and Discord? I need to keep screaming about Bleeding Edge. Help. Keep up the hard work. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I love this question. It's such an interesting yeah, struggle. That's a of, really nice question. I like that a lot. Yeah. What do you do when you see your favorite game dying other than try and convince your loudmouth friends to play it with you and to tell them about it but is there any world where bleeding edge could turn around and not be shut down within a couple of years i mean probably. probably not but he could have his friends review it reviewing can be important to like getting certain considerations and positions on steam so yeah. you know that can be helpful i just have like my indie marketing brain turned on right now um like you could like be the core facilitator of like building communities on new platforms but like ultimately like how much can one person you know change it you got to get like a mass at some point right i would also i don't know if this is uh would work but like share clips of like cool things that happen in that game like really short digestible things and try to get those like you know shared because like that's that's what Fall Guys is for me now, is just like mm. watching weird stuff happening in like little 20 second versions. And if I started seeing that for Bleeding Edge, I would be like, oh, maybe I should check this out. So you're yeah. saying Bleeding Edge should pull the reverse and incorporate a Bean character into their world? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Smart. Uh, Bean Down Brian Even from Fall the Guys show? isn't on Xbox One, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, Being down, Brian writes in and says, Hey, Ben, the CLCs, while Game Pass is undeniably a great deal and fully deserving of every bit of praise it gets, is there any concern for where this model leads us in the future, especially if adapted by other big publishers? The goal of this type of service is to keep players in a long term subscription, and one of the best ways of doing that is through live games. While Microsoft's recent showing quelled my fears to a degree, I can't help but wonder if these services ultimately lower the incentive to create new single player focused games when those may only encourage someone to jump in for one month. Do you think there's some concern here? An interesting idea. I would think so, except Microsoft and the ramp up to support Game Pass, all the studios that they purchased that we can see aren't living game studios. I mean, Halo Infinite, I guess, they're pushing more in that direction and we don't know exactly the extent of Fable. And, you know, the Forza games are always ongoing to a certain degree, but... I mean, the fact that they're thinking it's wise to invest in a studio like Double Fine is a good sign, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that temptation already exists in the marketplace just in terms of making games that have a lot of tra- microtransactions and season passes and all of those 
you know, battle passes. Like that is where that impetus is coming. I think, I think with game pass, they just need you to have good experiences. And if it's, yeah. I mean, like all these indie games that we've been talking about, if you can sit down and have a good 10 hour experience and then go on to the next game, Microsoft, Microsoft just has to keep on bringing new games to it. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to be playing the same game the entire time. I think just the variety helps them even. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a fair concern, but so far it, it's, it's looking pretty good to, you know, be how I would prefer it, which is a lot of single player experiences. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Um, are you all ready to get weird? No. Okay, great. Uh, Forrest Gerlock writes in and says, oh, Bello Ben Banson band, but <laughs> Ben Bax brew. That wasn't even the weird part. Uh, it's time for a simple trivia game. Little Big Planet song or GTA mission. As the title suggests, each name below is either a song from one of the Little Big Planet soundtracks or a story mission from the Grand Theft Auto series. It's up to you to figure out which. Oh, boy. All right, Anna, you look the most nervous about this. Would you like to go first? Yeah, All right, let's is, do it. Is this a GTA mission or a Little Big Planet song? Wrong side of the tracks. Little Big Planet song. I'm sorry, that's a mission from GTA San Andreas. Oh, I'm sorry, you're eliminated I forever. You have to hang up right now. I'm okay about that answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kyle, Street. fifth of Beethoven. Um, fifth of Beethoven? Not Beethoven's fifth. Yeah. Make a little big planet song from Little Big Planet too. Nicely done, Jeff. Um, right. I only have eyes for you. GTA. That is a song from Little Big Planet three. Uh, Anna, did somebody say yoga? GTA five. Yeah, GTA <laughs> five specifically, killing it. Yeah, Michael, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and Kyle, horny old man. Oh boy. I'm going to go Little Big Planet. It is a song from Little Big Planet 1. Technically, it was cut from the game, but it's still on the official soundtrack release, Tyler and all. Is that the one with the Muslim chants in it? No. I I doubt it. (laughs) Were multiple songs cut from that soundtrack? I don't know. I went because it seems so obviously a GTA mission that that's why I went Little Big Planet. Very smart. Thank you for your bizarre game, Forrest. Uh, What do we all like for question of the week? Comment of the week. What made the show better this week? I, I mean, I think we all salad. said it. Like, salad, salad was good too, actually. But I was thinking maybe bleeding edge, bleeding edge or salad. Oh, <laughs> bleeding edge or salad is a stupid sentence. Um, <laughs> uh, I like the IGN Avengers discussion. Yeah, those uh, are too. I like the you know, is a character going to join the ranks? Uh, I like Jonathan writing in with a big old caterpillar explanation that helped. Easy rebuttal from last week. Um, I like the running at full speed just because I like running at full <laughs> speed. I like the new form of entertainment. Anna, which way are you leaning? I like the um, the bleeding edge. How to support those games? All right, Jeff, yeah. are you down for that? Sure. Great. There we go. Jacob L., congratulations. You win uh, the vinyl soundtrack of Florence from I Am 8-Bit. Thanks to I Am 8-Bit for shipping this stuff out. And again, everything in their store is 10% off. Use the promo code MINMAXSHOW. Thanks so much for your support. If you want to submit a comment and possibly win in the future, you can support us at any tier. And then there's a post up every Tuesday looking for our comments and questions. And now it's time for something we call Get a Load of This. Jeff, um, Flores, dude. That's right. Hey, get a load of this. Uh, This is an article from BoardPanda.com, and it's about a very good girl, a dog named Eclipse, that apparently takes the bus by itself to the park every day in Seattle. What? It's a a dog. The backstory is that uh, there was... A guy was ta- had his dog at the park, and he stopped for a cigarette break, and the dog just left without him and got on the bus because it was so used to it and went home, and, and the guy just went home and found the dog there. And ever since that, the dog just takes itself to the park on the bus. And, like, all the bus drivers know him, and all the people on the route are, like, always super happy to see this dog. And the dog just 
gets on and goes to the park for a couple hours and then comes home also on the bus. That's amazing. What a good pup. Uh, Anna, do you have something? Yeah. Um, so I really liked this video from um, Andy Lanique, and he like is like he was at Discord um doing like business development but like he's also he's known online for his cooking and so like he's kind of like a chef and he went through and explained like how he would incorporate various um like video game characters <laughs> into dishes and it was like pres- like this perfect range of horrifying to like you have thought way too much about this to like oh wow yeah that's like a very practical use to um cook kirby um and so i really enjoyed it um it was like it went over kirby slime um what else um there are some like slime from dragon quest is that right yeah Yeah. um there's another really good one yoshi um yeah (laughs) scrambled eggs that's awesome cool the links are uh below wherever you're watching this or listening to this uh kyle uh, I had a very simple one that just made me laugh. It's so stupid. It's an 18 second video. I believe it was made by at Pablo Rochat. I hope they didn't just take the video and steal it. I hope they actually made it. But you know those um, on bulletin boards, you'll see something that's like a paper. It's like guitar lessons. And then they have the strips at the bottom where you yeah. can pull off the phone numbers. Well, this guy, he just made one of those. And it says, uh, tired of being a bird. And then it has the little... <laughs> tags on the bottom yeah. uh, with the phone numbers and what he did is he like just coded the the tags with like food that birds like and he taped the thing to the bottom of like a pole in the street <laughs> and it's just it's a 16 second video of all these birds going up and like pulling numbers <laughs> it's just one of those things I was like this is so smart and so, so stupid good. and it has literally made me laugh out loud just to see all these little pigeons be like yeah, I am tired of being a bird. <laughs> and it's that's always going to be funny. Like, I saw it, too, and got a good chuckle out of it, and then I forgot about it until right okay. now. It's like, you know what? That is one of the funniest things you can do on planet Earth is make a bird take yeah, one of those things. It's simple. <laughs> so oh, it just made me laugh. It was that's really good. good. Uh, in honor of our Halo Deepest Dive, I was listening to an episode of the Game Maker's Notebook, which normally Ted Price hosts, which is great because it's Ted Price, who's now a Sony employee, you know, head of Insomniac, um, interviewing people from around the game industry. But in this episode, it was Austin Winery, who did the soundtrack for Journey, other other games, um, interviewing Marty O'Donnell about his career. Uh, and it's a very long interview, but it's the best I've ever heard with Marty O'Donnell. Obviously, a lot of good Halo insight there. Um, a couple of facts from this. One, Marty says that he invented the term audio director for when he was working on the sequel to Mist Riven. He was trying to figure out the title and he pitched just, I want to be in control of everything, so I'm going to invent the term audio director and now it's become a video game industry staple. Uh, And then he talked about working with Paul McCartney and he said that they paid Paul McCartney with stock in Bungie, which he then (laughs) said, I don't think I was supposed to say that, but all right, whatever. Uh, And then he also, he does a lot of teasing where he also says that he has, like a behind the scenes crew was filming him and Mike, his partner, working with Paul McCartney for an hour, and they have an hour of footage that's unreleased of Paul McCartney working on Destiny, and he even teased it by being like, hmm, I might even have it on my computer, hmm, which is fine because Mario O'Donnell has his own YouTube channel, and he's just been uploading everything on his computer, including, like, the video I made back at Game Informer about him at Bungie, and he just, like, uploads the full thing, and, like... I assume Game Game Informer isn't going to copyright strike him. Um, But then he also had this fun story where he talked about getting comfortable with Paul and Paul McCartney. And he started to get, like, Paul McCartney was asking for his feedback on something and he could tell that Marty O'Donnell was nervous. And at a certain point, uh, Paul McCartney says, hey, Marty, it's just us. It's just the two of us in the room. (laughs) You can say, fuck you, Paul, and I can say, fuck you you marty we're at that level it's like, such a fun idea from paul mccartney saying you can say fuck you paul uh anyways community get a load of this jeff um do you have one that you pulled yeah. from discord yeah get a load of this uh this is another one from shazira she's just been killing it uh it is a rock paper shotgun article from imogene beckling uh i'm <laughs> apologies for mutilating that one uh uh-huh. but this developer named Jonaman Nordhagen created a virtual museum of lock picking or a, lo- a museum of yeah. virtual lock picking where he basically has gone through 
and recreated every lock picking mini game from different games and laid them out in this virtual museum. Yeah. That you can check out on itch.io. Uh, has Captain Stubbs one weighed in on this with yeah. his ask a locksmith podcast? I don't know. Oh my gosh. We need his feedback, his official yeah, review. Email him. That yeah. collab needs to happen. It needs to happen. Uh, thank you for watching or listening to this episode of the MinMax show. We appreciate it. Thanks to everybody in the backstage past here that have watched us record us live um, yeah. and have had feedback throughout the entire thing. It's always fun to look at that little fun, nice chat room. Again, that's at the $10 tier. You also get to vote on uh, the Great Goatee Hunt every week and a bunch of fun behind the scenes stuff. Um, and thanks to folks at the $50 tier. Uh, we will read their name at the end of every episode of the podcast. You can join the group for next month if you'd like. So thanks to Captain Stubbs One, The Bam Box, I Am 8-Bit, Jawar Hello, Mirko Rico Toreno, Time Bomb Tom, Tyler Carver, Zachary, P- Zachary Pelegi, Beaten Down Brian, Rebecca Lang, Brian with a Y, Mark Seliga, Andrew Valla, Ludwig Roque, Jesse Vitelli, Brett Hunter, Thomas Hoster, Snake24, Yaro, Rob Hudak, William Garcia, Tom Blackburn, Spiral in Your Eyes, Scott Castro, Thomas Hankins, Richard Smuts, JT Fells, Spider Dan, Paul Arias, Andrew Sanford, Chris, Steve Bamdad, Matthew Paxton, Cameron Wardlaw, Thank you so much, everybody. Be good, have fun, let's go! Bye!